Okay, Sanero, are you ready? Yes, I am, uh, Tim. <laughs> All right, but let's uh, let's get started. Sanero, go ahead. Please kick us off. Okay, thanks. So, uh, good day, everyone. My name is Sanero Costa Jr. And uh, on behalf of the CGIR program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, I would like to welcome uh, everyone to the webinar Enhancing Investment in Soil Health and Carbon Storage, which has been uh, co organized by the World Bank, the CCAFs, the Nature Conservancy, the Four Premier uh, Secretariat, and the Meridian Institute. So, the purpose of this webinar, uh, next slide, please builds on the growing interest in the recognition of the role soil carbon can play in achieving uh, global climate goals, such as the two degree target of the Paris Agreement, and also uh, in <clears throat> potentially safeguarding food security and helping to build in more resilient uh, food systems. Right, uh, but however, to harness the soil carbon potential, uh, next slide, please. We need a scale, and the scale requires some enabling conditions, such as policies and technical practices. Must, but mo most importantly, finance, and uh, which is currently currently lagging. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the main constraints preventing finance flowing towards carbon projects and initiatives is the way we uh, measure and account for soil carbon. So most of the times we rely on costly and time consuming methods that is not, creates a situation not compatible with the financial needs. So to overcome this barrier and unlock the potential soil carbon has, this webinar proposes to answer a single question. So next slide, please. How can soil carbon accounting to be improved to support investment oriented actions, promoting soil carbon storage? So to help us answering these questions, after several months of uh, dedication to make this webinar happen, we are fortunate to put together here uh, and bring some of the greatest minds and most innovative companies and uh, innovations uh, and uh, initiatives working on this field. And uh, they will be discussing today's, to, today over two sessions. One, the need for soil carbon accounting and two, account, soil accounting frontiers on methods and technologies. They will also be highlighting opportunities for actions and how these opportunities could be useful for investors to account for soil carbon sequestration. Thus, of course, we are very pleased and happy to have them here. We are also pleased to have uh, this audience who has basically more than 1,000 people registered today. And uh, finally, we'll be uh, navigating through this webinar under the facilitation of Tim Milley from the Meridian Institute. So, well, let's get started. Thank you all again for coming. And I now pass the floor to Tim Mealy. So, uh, Tim, thank you so much for the facilitation today. Uh, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Madeline, uh, can you advance the slide, please? So, as uh, Sonero said, my name is Tim Mealy. I'm a senior partner and managing director at the Meridian Institute. And we're very pleased to be serving as facilitator of this webinar this packed full webinar with, with great subject matter experts and a really compelling and important topic uh, regarding uh, soil carbon and, and uh, finance and monitoring and verification, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a packed agenda. There will be uh, live captions. So there you can see those of you who want to avail yourself to live captioning, please um, type into your browser the, the, uh, the bit.ly, uh, uh, URL that you see on the screen there and you'll avail yourself to the closed captioning uh, that is being provided by the University of Vermont through Amanda Lundberg. So thank you, Amanda, for that. Um, the agenda, if you can advance the slide, I'm going to just cover the first bit of the agenda. But basically, after I'm done here, we'll get a keynote presentation from Deborah Basio. 
followed by some uh, some thoughts and, and uh, important contributions from Martin Van Newkoop from the World Bank and Keith Postian from uh, Colorado State University. Uh, we have three Q&A sessions during the course of the, uh, the webinar, um, each of them 15 minutes each. So we will be taking your questions through the Q&A uh, function, which you should find in the menu bar on your screen. Uh, please feel free to submit questions as we go. Uh, both Siniro and, and Kyle uh, from, uh, from the team at University of Vermont will be helping to, uh, to collate and curate and compile those questions for me and I will verbally convey them. Hopefully we can combine some of your questions into one and cover as much as we can in those 15 minutes. Please be clear when you're posing a question to a specific presenter or panelist, or if it's a general question that anybody can respond to, and we'll do our best to get as many questions in during that uh, period. Um, the other sections of the agenda uh, will include presentations, uh, two sets of four presentations. Uh, you have um, access to bios for all of the presenters, so I will not be uh, sharing with you the important background and pedigree and, and expertise that they all bring to bear. But as uh, Sanero said, we have a really stellar lineup here. Um, so in the, uh, hopefully someone from the team here can put that URL for the bios into uh, the chat. So the chat function has been disabled just so we can keep our attention focused um, and not get disturbed. Um, but we will be able to share with you information like I just indicated the chat function now should have for all of you. Uh, you should see the uh, the link to the bios uh, that Bailey just shared. So um, let's see. Um, the presenters know that there will be a, a very strict time limit. And here's my red, red waving flag. A couple of you joined a little late, but uh, I'll be waving this when you have two minutes in, uh, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to move on after the allotted time uh, in the agenda for your presentations. Um, and we're gonna have to be pretty strict about that. And I apologize for that in advance. Um, so let's see. Um, the webinar is being recorded and uh, the slides will be made available. Uh, and so don't, uh, don't worry about that. You will have access, all of you as attendees to, to the slides on the website, uh, the same website that we're using to share the bios with you. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna suggest uh, we get started. And, uh, and Deborah, if you, there you go, come off. Uh, come on to video and uh, and Martin as well if you could come on to video as well so we can have the first set of presenters be uh, be ready to go but Deborah over to you please great thank you so much um, good morning everybody afternoon and good evening from wherever you're joining around the world I'm speaking to you from um, a very smoky California I do hope you have bluer skies where you are please advance the slides Uh, and the next slide. So I work with the Nature Conservancy, which is a global environmental nonprofit. Uh, we work in 70 countries around the world to create uh, a better future where people and nature can both thrive. We organize ourselves around um, three global priorities, which are um, tackling climate change, protecting land and waters, uh, in particular trying to create healthy land, water, and ecosystems where, where biodiversity and communities can thrive. And within food systems, one of our primary strategies is scaling regenerative agriculture um, as a way to uh, build soil carbon, which is foundational to achieving all of our goals. So soil carbon is really core to our agenda at Nature Conservancy. Next slide. Thinking about climate mitigation in particular, um, we all know now that we need both clean energy and um, nature-based solutions to, if we want to have any hope of um, achieving a climate-stable world in the future. Um, we've done a lot of work to build the evidence base around natural climate solutions, uh, and we now have a, a, a goal number about one-third of the mitigation opportunity that we need um, along with two thirds of clean energy is can be found in our land based ecosystems. And that includes strategies around 
protection and restoration of our forests and wetlands and peatlands and grasslands, but also management of our croplands and grazing lands, which is um, more the topic of our, of our um, discussions this morning. Next slide. If you dive a little bit deeper into this issue of natural climate solutions, you find that soil carbon itself is 25% of this natural solution. In these bars, soil carbon is represented by the dark portions of the bars, which are the overall opportunity. Uh, now, soil carbon has a role to play both in avoided emissions, especially if you look at the bottom half of the graph. This is in wetlands and peatlands, these very high carbon ecosystems a lot of carbon underground and avoiding the loss of that carbon is absolutely essential strategy for climate future. Um, but in the grasslands and um, croplands in the middle of the, the graph, we see soil carbon uh, really stands out in terms of the potential sink, so as a carbon removal strategy. The other, uh, and this is about half of the mitigation opportunity in agriculture, the other half is around um, avoided emissions of non-CO2 greenhouse gases, particular methane uh, from rice and from animal agriculture and um, N2O from, from uh, fertilizers. What I like to emphasize from this analysis is that um, if we focus only on uh, avoided emissions of non-CO2 greenhouse gases from agriculture, we're going to miss this opportunity in sequestering carbon below ground and getting that piece of the puzzle. But if we focus only on soil carbon, we'll miss the emissions uh, reductions opportunity, and we may even exacerbate the emissions. So for agriculture, it's very important to maintain a holistic view of the mitigation opportunity. Next slide. Uh, the other thing that we would miss if we don't put any attention into rebuilding soil carbon uh, in our farming and uh, grazing systems is the um, tremendous co-benefits that we get from, from uh, building soil health. Uh, these co-benefits uh, vary uh, across space. Uh, in the US Midwest, for example, the co-benefits around water are tremendously important. Cleaner water, less water use in agriculture. In completely different ecosystems, say in the Ethiopian highlands where yield gaps are high, and soil carbon contents are low, uh, building soil health and soil carbon can close yield gaps and have other important co-benefits, some very underappreciated, like uh, improving the nutrient values of grain. Next slide. Now we're taking this work on sort of global estimates of what the potential is in very specific pathways and trying to map it out on the ground as a, as a tool for decision making. Um, so the Soils Revealed platform is a um, collaboration between Nature Conservancy, uh, ISRIC, the, the um, World uh, Soil Information Center, the Woodwell Climate Research Center, formerly Woods Hole, and Cornell University. This platform will be launched later this year. It'll be a place where decision makers, investors, or the general public can go zoom in on their area of interest on the planet, whether it's country or region or province, and explore information that uh, talks about uh, how soil carbon has changed over historic time periods, how land use decisions has changed soil carbon contents over the last 20 years, and then explore potential soil carbon futures based on IPC scenarios around what can be done in terms of building soil carbon in uh, croplands here in green and grazing lands here in blue. Next slide. Now, despite all of the work that we and so many others have done to uh, elaborate the potential, um, we know that there's this gigantic gap between the potential that we have in this opportunity and um, actual action on the ground. Uh, I see sort of a few main buckets of challenges. Um, one, the lack of awareness and confidence around soil organic matter as a, as a mitigation strategy. Uh, and there, any work we can do to get more practical experience on the ground is going to help. There's a couple other areas, lack of capacity, supporting project development, lack of upfront funding. Um, everyone uh, is aware that it's no easy task to bring a program to a state of being investable. Uh, and it, in both we need both capacity to support that process and also upfront funding there. So those are important. 
What we're focusing on a lot more in this, um, these few hours together is these other two challenges. One, the lack of cost-effective and standardized approaches to predict and monitor changes in soil carbon. And the other, that existing protocols are not really working very well for regenerative agriculture projects. Uh, things like additionality need some strong thought um, uh, before it really works for, for agriculture. And many of our speakers are going to speak directly to these challenges. I want to just explore them a bit in detail by focusing on a few specific projects, sort of ground these challenges in something real. Next slide. Civil pasture systems in Colombia have a very high per hectare carbon sequestration potential below ground and also in the trees above ground. Um, here we're talking about improved pastures, improved grazing, uh, protecting forest margins, live fences, strong local livelihood benefit, uh, strong forest protection benefit. Um, uh, the challenges uh, it, in a complex uh, program like this, as you can imagine, the MRV challenges are significant. Um, and one special challenge we have is that often what we're looking for now is modeling and field-based approaches combined to cut the costs of MRV. But in this situation, you know, a lot of the models are calibrated to the temperate ecosystems, and they're not as robust for tropical ecosystems with weathered soils. This is an area that really could use attention. Next slide. In, the northern, in Kenya, the Northern Rangelands Trust has just begun to offer a, um, uh, a huge offering of credits uh, from a um, grassland restorations program, 37 million tons of CO2 equivalent over the next 20 years. Uh, it's the largest single offering of credits from, from an African program. Um, this uh, is based on the fact that these semi-arid grasslands are very degraded and can be restored. The livelihood benefits are enormous and the benefits to wildlife as well. Um, the challenge here was to develop and get approved a new protocol. Um, uh, this calls attention to the fact that the more protocols we have developed, the, be the, the better the menu of protocols we have, the easier it will be for more people to join uh, and bring projects to, to the table. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention here is this, the, how, how uh, strong the cost issue is in terms of MRV. MRV, monitoring, reporting, valuation of soil carbon change, can be very expensive, especially when you have small changes uh, per unit area like we have in this project. We get over that here because of scale. We have several million hectares of, of land here, so the cost uh, makes sense, the cost of MRV. The more we can lower the cost of MRV, the more we can bring in different project sizes and bring more land uh, to bear onto our issues. Next slide. Um, another type of project that I want to mention, the Nebraska Soil Carbon Project, we're very excited about. It's brand new. We're expecting enrollment of about 100,000 acres of land. Um, here we have um, soils that have lost carbon over uh, decades of farming. We know that. We know we can build the carbon. And it's food companies that are interested in this and they're investing to bring um, uh, carbon insetting uh, for their value chains. Um, this is a great example of where there's two, a couple ways to think about this. And uh, one way that's easier is to think about it just as a practice-based approach where you just have to monitor practices. It's easier to promote, it's easier to monitor. The early California Healthy Soils Initiative, for example, took this kind of an approach. However, um, uh, we would like to see instead robust MRV so that we can learn a lot from these projects and outscale them more effectively and build confidence. To do so now, we're working with the Ecosystem Services Marketplace Consortium, you'll hear from them later, um, to make sure that we get robust MRV for this type of program. Um, several uh, later speakers are going to speak directly to this type of a project, I'm sure. So with that, I'd like to just thank you for being here. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from our other speakers and learning from all of you how we can advance our agenda to increase activity around soil carbon sequestration. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Deborah. Right on time. And, uh, and let me uh, shift and turn it over to Martin Van Newkoop from the World Bank. Martin, over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, if you can put up the slides, I mean, that would be very good. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. I'm very pleased to make this intervention at this uh, 
important uh, webinar. Um, I'm not a soil scientist, I'm an agricultural economist, but I'm very pleased in this intervention to actually to make the case that soil health is a public good, in fact, a, a global public good, and therefore investments in soil health deserve public support. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what is a challenge? You know, uh, by 2050, the global food system needs to produce 56% more food, I mean, to feed 9.8 billion people. Um, with business as usual, they would require about 600 million more hectares of land, twice the size of India. Of course, COVID-19 COVID is demonstrating that the risk associated with doing so is severe because of the encroachment of agriculture to natural habitat is associated with the increase in zoonotic diseases. Uh, and 75% of the, of the pandemics that we have seen over the last 20 years or so have a zoonotic ori uh, origin. So the, the implication is that sustainable intensification is the only pathway to increase needed agricultural production to feed 9.8 billion people by 2050. Um, also, greenhouse gas emissions associated with agricultural land use right now are around 11 to 12 gigatons per year. They need to reduce to four gigatons in line with a two degree world. With business as usual, it will go up to 15 gigatons. So considering that healthy soils offer one of the cheapest ways to sequester carbon and that successful sustainable intensification is the only feasible way um, and of course needs to be rooted in healthy soil, it is clear that healthy soil should be at the heart of any efforts to ensure that the global food system meets the mounting challenge that it is facing and produce 56% more food by 2050. Next slide, please. Um, at the World Bank, we are pleased to take this message at heart and put the money where our mouth is. Uh, since the Coronivia Joint Work Program on Agriculture started in 2017, we have ramped up our investment in climate smart agriculture. Right now, these climate co benefits exceed 50%. Uh, we do about three uh, to four billion dollars in new financing every year. So it means actually that we are providing about two billion dollars a year uh, in climate financing and thereby we'll be one of the largest investors in the agriculture and climate uh, agenda. And a lot of that is related to soil and soil health. Next slide. Uh, we think that there are a number of important actions, I mean, to be taken to facilitate implementation of soil health enhancing inventions at scale with aim to ensure broad social benefits. Um, we need to raise the profile of the soil health agenda with stakeholders, especially policymakers. Uh, take the farmers, and I think Deborah also said it as, well, as essential actors who are key providers of both food and ecosystem services. Uh, farmers, we think, are more likely to respond to the message of healthy and productive soils, more so than future climate change as a driver for adoption or soil health prom promoting practices. We need knowledge and technical support, and of course, the right financing. And here, we think repurposing of public subsidies will be key, uh, as well as the active involvement of the private sector. Next slide. So since, ho since soil health can be considered a public good, there's particularly a need to look to, into how the public support could be mobilized I mean, to support investments in healthy soil. Uh, public support to agriculture is significant. It's about $600 billion per year. Currently, only 16% of this is allocated to the provision of public goods. The rest is for subsidies and coupled output support that is highly distorting, generating significant allocative and technical inefficiencies, as well as negative environmental externalities. Most support is going to large farmers. And with production risk increasing because of climate change, most support is also becoming less relevant to farmers. And what's the word of an input subsidy if farmers lose their crop because of a drought? For that reason, we think there's a very strong case to be made to repurpose existing public support to agriculture by decoupling it from production decisions and directly linking it to the generation of positive environmental outcomes. And for the reasons mentioned earlier, we think that linking public support to investments in soil health by farmers would be most effective in unlocking triple win benefits. But I mean, as Deber also said, since we're talking about the use of public resources, there is of course need for a sound accountability framework. And for that reason, the development of a low cost, almost real time monitoring, reporting and verification protocol would be most critical. In our view, this is the missing link. I mean, this is the missing piece of the puzzle. If you can fix that, you can unlock $600 billion in financing. I mean, for uh, soil health. Um, next slide. Um, of course, I mean, uh, based on our experience, there's need for a broad coalition. Um, 
as I said, it is also need, I mean, to make the business case to farmers uh, and taking into account, I mean, the vested interest and relevant policy, uh, political economy dimensions. Uh, the good news, of course, is that the menu of options of farmers is immense, which means there are many possibilities to tailor investments in soil health, I mean, to local agroecological conditions. Next slide. Uh, the bank is already active uh, on, this, um, on this agenda. Um, we have a major investment in, in Kenya based on our first work I mean, where we um, uh, finance a project that earned, uh, earned carbon credit under the verified carbon standard. Uh, this was one of the first projects. And then as a follow-up, I mean, we have a large investment in climate smart agriculture, um, which is focusing on scaling up climate smart agricultural interventions, including soil management, uh, fertility management, agroforestry, crop diversification, uh, all uh, practices that are promoting, I mean, good soil health. Next slide. Uh, it's interesting that Deborah mentioned the Colombia example. I mean, the bank has been actively engaged in this. I mean, uh, invested about $27 million in the um, generating a proof of concept, I mean, for silver pastoral systems to capture triple win benefits. Uh, this is really attractive. It shows, I mean, that those technologies are really powerful. Uh, economic returns of between 25 and 30 percent, productivity increases but uh, by 17 percent, stocking rate increase by 15 percent, uh, cost of production going down, uh, leading to increased incomes of up to $500 per hectare. I mean, this is a story that you want to tell to farmers. Of course, on top of that, I mean, we have uh, mitigation benefits, I mean, from two to, to, to two to 10 tons per hectare, as Deborah said as well. I mean, the total estimated, um, you know, uh, greenhouse gas, uh, you know, the carbon sequestration uh, estimated to be generated by this project is about 1.1 uh, million tons, you know, at the social price of carbon, uh, shadow price of carbon that the bank uses of $40 uh, a ton. Uh, that is uh, the equivalent of $44 million. Uh, this is stacked against the investment of $27 million. So the economic, um, uh, picture actually is very favorable and very attractive to invest in, in, in soil health. Um, next slide, please. Um, then uh, Kazakhstan, uh, we are investing half a billion dollars in a sustainable livestock development program, um, which promotes climate smart agriculture to the development of good grassland management and animal husbandry practices, including manure management. And in order for farmers, I mean, to get the public support that they need actually to put in place their tech, uh, their, those technology practices, the technical assistance, I mean, they need to fulfill their environmental criteria to access this uh, public support. So this is repurposing public support uh, at work. Next slide, last slide. Here are the main messages. Um, I want to emphasize three, I mean, need for analytics and coalition building, uh, since this is a multi-sectoral agenda and there's a big political economy, make the business case to farmers and have an MLV protocol in place that is low cost and almost real time. This is the missing piece. If we can fix that, I mean, um, I see a very bright future of moving this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, those of you who are asking questions about whether these slides will be available, yes, indeed, they will. So um, we will make them available through the web platform um, that you can download uh, those slides. Um, thank you, Martin, for your presentation and staying on time. Keith, over to you, please. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, next slide. Yeah, so thanks for having me here today. Uh, I wanna outline some of the key issues around soil, quantif soil carbon quantification. Uh, methods. And, and as Deb mentioned, uh, non-CO2 greenhouse gas is important too. A lot of the principles I'll be talking about apply to that, but probably don't have time to go into that. And then I want to end up with some what I view as near-term uh, opportunities for improvements in our quantification systems. And I think it'll, it'll relate to what some of the subsequent speakers are going to talk about. Okay, go ahead. Next slide. So I think everyone agrees that we've got different uh, uh, different kinds of policies, but but all of them really need reliable metrics. And whether that's for carbon markets or sustainable supply chain initiatives or corporate insetting, uh, however, there's really some significant challenges to accurately quantify carbon sequestration, particularly at field to local scale. And one of the main issues is 
is really the, the spatial variability in soil carbon stocks, uh, even within a, a field. Go ahead and give a click. Uh, here's, a, here's a picture of, uh, of some data from the Kellogg Biological Station Long-Term Ecological Research in, in Michigan, where they you know, really looked in detail at the spatial variability of a number of attributes within what really looks to be a flat uniform field. You can see in that case that you've got you know, a twofold difference in, in soil carbon across that field, very patchily distributed. So, and, and it's even more. So there's lots of within field uh, variability. Uh, next slide. So that means that you have to, uh, you know, you have to sample intensively. You also have a, what I guess I would call a low signal to background range. In other words, we have a lot of soil carbon in many places relative to the annual changes. So sometimes that, that annual signal is, is, you know, less than 1%. So you really need to, uh, you know, to, to measure over multiple years. Next slide. So, and there's also a, concept, a complex set of abiotic and biotic control factors that really determine these changes. Uh, I think there's one more click. And unfortunately, there are no gauges and it's not like a tree. You can't reach out and grab it. Uh, next slide. So what are some of the consequences for this kind of local scale measurement? Um, and I would say that the accuracy depends on, on several things that I, I alluded to earlier. We've got the variability in soil carbon stocks and stock change rates. So that really affects the sampling intensity you need, the magnitude of the change rate, which affects the, the resampling frequency and the accuracy of your carbon stock determinations at any point where you take a sample. And that relates to your analytical methods. Go ahead and click. And what that, that means is that you typically need, uh, at, a, at a local field scale, you might need ten, multiple tens of, of samples to, to have sufficient intensity, uh, depending on what your, your, your desired minimal detection difference is. Uh, typically, you'd want to have a resampling inter, inter, interval of, of five years or more in order to let a change accumulate over time. Uh, and also that really, if you want to do accurate analytics, the most accurate methods are still require destructive sampling and lab analysis. Uh, next slide, or not next, just click forward. Yeah, and so we're, you know, there's been a lot of work to do things, uh, spectroscopic analysis, uh, min infrared, uh, for example, can, can really increase the throughput and reduce the cost, but uh, for the most part, still requires a lot of processing and destructive sampling. Some of the in situ methods that people are working on are improving, but still there are just some issues dealing with that. So I think the bottom line is that, you know, direct measurement is generally too expensive to use routinely for deployment in most mitigation projects. So you can't only rely on that. I think we need to use, uh, we need to use our direct measurement capabilities more strategically. Uh, next slide. So when we go to a little bit more aggregate scale, say a sub-regional, regional, I think that the picture gets a little bit brighter. We have more confidence in our, in our estimates. Uh, one thing, we have a legacy of long-term experiments that have you know, really research grade measurements over time and differences between management treatments. And so one of the things that that means is I think we have some quite accurate uh, estimates via meta-analysis of what you know, what the overall or what the average impacts of different kinds of, of management practices are, despite what you might read sometimes in, in the, uh, on various blogs. Uh, but the other part about that is we really have a resource that also helps to uh, inform our understanding of, of regional and, and national average approaches. Go ahead, next, uh, next, next uh, click forward one. And so I think we, we also then have a, a pretty good ability at these regional and sub-regional scales to, to, you know, to use uh, predictive modeling capabilities. And, you know, just as one example, if we look at the, the estimates for soil carbon change uh, over time in, in the U.S. national inventory, our 95% confidence interval there is, is about plus or minus 20% of the mean. So at these more aggregate scales, we have much better predictive abilities. Next slide. 
kind of another example, a rather unique example of this is a, is a study that was done a few years ago in, in the Midwest. It was called the Midwest Intensive. And what's interesting about that is that uh, we really used two different independent methods to estimate the, the, the carbon stock or the carbon balance for, for that Corn Belt region. And one was uh, to do the kind of bottom-up uh, process-based modeling inventory using information about the practices and the soils and the, and the weather, et cetera, and kind of model at a fine scale and then aggregate those results up uh, versus using a, a totally different technique, which involves atmospheric transport modeling and, and using uh, carbon dioxide sampling taken at, at a series of towers and with airplanes and basically then doing a, what's called a, a top-down uh, modeling approach. And, and what's really encouraging is those, you know, for that region, the, the, uh, there was quite a good agreement between the top-down and the bottom-up modeling. So that, again, gives us some confidence in our predictive modeling capabilities at, at larger spatial scales, if you will. Okay, next slide. So what I, I think when we talk about carbon finance and some of the examples that were given earlier, we're, we really, what we're looking at is, is to have kind of low cost estimates with low or, or no bias preferably and, and probably moderate uncertainty. I think there's always gonna be uncertainty more than, than, than for you know, engineered projects and stuff like this, but, but uncertainty that we can deal with. And what we need to do is really, I think, focus on high quality direct measurements. So do our direct measurements strategically. Don't try to do them everywhere. And, and rather than do a lot of, of, of poor quality measurements, really, really, you know, where we do direct measurements, make sure that we do them well. Uh, I think we, we need to continue to work on re reducing the uncertainty of, of our predictive models at more, you know, local scales. And, and we really need to develop tools also that can easily incorporate the farm level activity data, information about what's actually happening on the landscape. That's a, that's a critical piece of it. Next slide. And I think, so, so I think that takes us to this idea of, of we really need a platform, an integrated measurement modeling activity data platform. And here's a, a, a picture of an example of that, that, that comes out of a, a, a couple of papers recently. Uh, and over here on the left-hand side, just as an example, I won't talk more about it, but I mentioned before, you know, the long-term experiments give us a lot of information or, or understanding of, of the processes that feed into the models. We also need to have more, uh, you know, soil monitoring networks. These are the places where we do those high-quality measurements and and, and and utilize that. And so the models and that kind of data feeds into a this quantification platform, I call it. So go ahead and next uh, click, click once. And a really, I think an important part, a lot of folks are working on this, I think there's tremendous promise, is how can we better integrate remote sensing and, and other kind of spatial data layers to give us that granularity? And I think Bill Salas is gonna talk to more, a little bit more about that. Uh, next slide. And as kind of an example of that, I think remote sensing has the capabilities, two different things. One is it allows us to, to gather quite inexpensively and accurately uh, a lot of management activity data in terms of, of you know, what's the tillage, the, the presence, the cr uh, crop types and cover crop presence, that sort of thing. But we can also use remote sensing estimates of, of uh, what I call, you know, productivity. And one half of the, of the carbon balance is the carbon that's taken up by the plants that ultimately some of that goes into the soil. So can we use data simulation techniques with our models, for example, to increase the uh, accuracy at, at more local scales? Okay, next slide. Two more. And then finally, again, I, I think it's really important, uh, go back one, uh, that, that we have systems that the, 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 the land manager on the ground can, can, can interact with, can, provide information to and, and feed into that because they're really the ones that know better than anyone else what's happening what's happening on the ground and i think that's in many cases the biggest source of uncertainty is 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 a, a lack of that activity data okay final slide 
So I think, you know, examples of when, and, and a lot of us are working on this. This is my group is, is developing these user-friendly decision support systems deployed in the US with USDA, the, the Comet systems, and really trying to essentially, uh, you know, build that kind of a, a integrated data modeling platform. Uh, I'd also, I should have included in here too, we've worked on a, uh, a system called the Car Carbon Benefits Project with financing from the World Bank and the Jeff and, and work with another groups. And that's a, a similar kind of a system, but more suited for deployment in, in developing countries. And we've, we've recently linked that system with the WOCAT uh, system that, that quantifies conservation practices worldwide and also land PKS, which is a system to, uh, to, to, to kind of crowdsource uh, information from local folks in developing countries using mobile phone technology. So those are the kind of things that I think are, are moving. We need to do more work to continue to improve these systems, but I think we're overall on, on the right track to, to do that. So I look forward to uh, seeing what the other speakers have to say and appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak today. Great. Thank you so much to Keith, Martin, and Deborah. We're pretty much right on time. Many of you have been submitting questions and I'm grateful to Sanero and Kyle for helping to select from among them. As I mentioned in the chat box, um, there will be an effort to try to respond to all of the questions uh, after this event uh, to the extent that that's gonna be possible. So please don't uh, think if your question was not posed, it was not important. Um, all of the questions you're posing are very important. So I'm gonna pose the first question to Deborah here. Deborah, um, how can we ensure the permanence of practices uh, incentivized by the projects um, and how can self-sustaining incentives be built into project design? Well, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, uh, in general, we're actually seeing the potential of um, carbon financing as one vehicle to help improve the permanence of, of the practices themselves. Um, uh, oftentimes pro programs are, are counting on the fact that there is a financial incentive for people to continue with, with uh, practices. For example, if the, you know, their profits are increased on the farm uh, by implementing regenerative agriculture, we're hoping to layer in carbon financing to make that even more uh, positive incentive to maintain the practices. Excellent. Um, thank you and we'll come back to you if we have time for another question. Um, uh, let's see, for Martin, what are the major steps that should be taken to really divert public subsidies to make sure that that diversion of public subsidies that you spoke about to soil, carbon, and health uh, projects? Any uh, thoughts on that? No, I, I think it's a very important question. Um, you know, what I said, I mean, the, the political economy is a very important dimension uh, because, you know, uh, from an economic point of view, there's no reason why the current uh, public support and subsidies are allocated in the way they are. They're actually part of the climate problem uh, because of all the, what I mentioned, uh, inefficiencies and negative environmental externalities um, that they generate. So how can we translate that you know, in a force for the, um, for, uh, for the good? Uh, I think important here is also that, you know, what I said, the MRV is, a very, is an important piece, missing piece of the puzzle and, um, but it seems to me that the, the requirements, I mean, the standards for an MRV might be different for the private sector perspective and the public sector perspective. You know, in my view, um, you know, for repurposing public support, I mean, we don't need the type of gold standard uh, MRV uh, that uh, probably private sector investors are looking for. And I think it's important that we take that into consideration in the deliberations of this, uh, of, 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 of this webinar. If somehow we would have, you know, a, a MRV that can measure soil health somehow as a proxy for soil carbon, I think that would be a very powerful argument, I mean, to convince ministers of finance and others, I mean, to repurpose, I mean, public uh, support because they know that the um, current public support is, is actually, you know, subtracting value and, and, and part of the problem. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Keith, question for you. What time interval uh, can be plausible to identify and measure a difference in soil carbon stocks under sustainable conservative agricultural practices? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It, 
you know, it really depends. And this is one of the challenges because it depends on, you know, it depends on where you are. It depends on the climate. So if you have, uh, you know, certain things happen more rapidly in, in uh, you know, more temperate climates or tropics. And then if you go to somewhere where it's dry and, and uh, you know, then, then climate determines a little bit the, you know, the, the rate of change. It depends on what it, what it is. If you're going from a highly degraded system to, to one that's much more productive and, and you're having a lot of carbon inputs, then you can begin to track the, the changes more, you know, more easily. So I think it's, that's one of the challenges is it varies. And, and so we need to have systems that can kind of deal with the range of response times. But typically, you know, I think for, you know, certainly for the measurement part of it, uh, you know, you want to normally not try to track things every year with, with soil sampling and measurements, but rather to, to, to let the changes accumulate. I think modeling capabilities give you a little bit more of an opportunity to kind of track things uh, on a more continuous basis. Excellent. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose a question now for all, all three of you. Um, Presently, uh, there's a significant focus on the use of abiotic measurements, meaning carbon itself. Yet in the future, uh, soil biotic measurements will be more telling um, and more, uh, you know, more helpful. Um, is this something, well, this is something that some, so, some folks are already working on. Um, and what are the thoughts of the, of the three speakers regarding the use of uh, biotic, soil, soil biotic measurements? Deborah, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, thank you. It's actually close to my heart. I did my PhD was in soil microbiology. Um, and uh, we have a, a new paper coming out with Johannes Lehman and others uh, talking about how, how we want to evaluate soil health and the fact that the biotic measurements are still lacking. I think there's still some time to come before we can make direct linkages between functions and services of soil to the, the measurements of the biology. So I think that's one reason that's sort of holding up um, mainstreaming of, of measuring biology. Uh, the science is advancing, uh, but I do feel that at the moment we have such simple ways to just simply, you know, a metric of the soil carbon uh, content is such a simple metric um, that we can, you know, move forward with that while the, the science advances around the biology. Great, thank you. Martin, any thoughts on this? Um, Go ahead. So, sorry, I thought I was muted. Um, well, I, I started out, I mean, by saying that I'm not a soil expert. I'm an agricultural economist, so I don't have much to say about the you know, technicalities here. But from where I'm sitting, I mean, clearly, I mean, there is huge urgency in moving forward and putting global food systems on a more, you know, a sustainable uh, foundation and then moving ahead with climate smart agriculture. So uh, for me, I mean, the earlier a um, MRV um, is available, I mean, the, the more powerful that will be to move fast on repurposing the public support. And this is significant. So my message is, you know, uh, perfectionism is the enemy of the good. And let's go ahead with what is minimum acceptable rather than, you know, aiming for the maximum desirable here. Great. Thank you. Uh, Keith, thoughts on this? Yeah. No, I would just add uh, to what, what the others have, have said that I think that the emphasis on soil health is really important, and 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 I in in a lot of ways I I think we you know I look at the soil if you can if you if you can have a healthy environment then the organisms and things are going to thrive there. So I think one of the important things about soil health and one of the reasons why carbon is so important because carbon has a huge effect on on the physical properties of the soil. So the aeration, the amount of water holding capacity, how well it, it drains and, and all of those things along with carbon as, as a you know as a food source for for the microbes in the soil, it, it's all, you know, it's called all kind of intertwined. But I think if we can so so carbon is a great integrating uh, variable, but if we can use that to also describe things about not only the biotic, but also the, the physical uh, properties of the soil as a habitat for life, then I think we, 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 we can help uh, move forward our understanding of soil health in, a, in really on a fundamental way. 
Excellent. Thank you. I think we're going to have enough time to go through another round here if you guys can keep your uh, responses um, uh, concise here. So Deborah, I'm going to turn to you. Can you please share some more about what and how you are building in-country networks for the Soil Revealed platform? Great. Yeah. Um, Soils Revealed, uh, we started out uh, in an experimental mode doing space-time modeling of the um, change of soil carbon to use actual data uh, from the ground in, in, a, in a modeling platform uh, to map the actual change. And in there, we work directly with INTA Argentina, so with the country program to, to bring uh, a lot of uh, data to bear. So we have an experimental data set on the platform, which is built directly with the Argentinian partners. Uh, as we go forward, we're looking to build on the networks of ISRIC, uh, who's also engaged in the Global Soil Partnership, who have existing partnerships with uh, national governments all around the world. So um, I, I couldn't start to mention all of the possible, all of the partnerships on that slide, just the main research partners. Thank Great, you. thank you. Um, let's see, Martin, for you, um, what are your thoughts on how subsidies targeted at environmental outcomes can avoid increasing inequality by privileging the larger, wealthier farmers who are better positioned to access knowledge, technology, and testing? Excellent question. Uh, but we should not forget, I mean, the point of departure. I mean, the existing uh, $600 billion in public support is already benefiting most of, uh, you know, mostly large farmers anyway. So, um, so, so it's not that repurposing, I mean, would necessarily change. I mean, that, you know, we'd be starting from a very good point actually to make sure that, uh, you know, that smallholder farmers can actually benefit for, uh, from repurposing public support. And I think if you link it to soil health um, and recognize you know, farmers as also providers of ecosystem services, um, you know, I think there's, potent there's a significant scope actually to make sure that the distribution actually you know, becomes more equal than it currently, uh, than it currently is. Uh, one other point, I mean, to re quickly respond also to what Tim said earlier, you know, um, where you talked about the water retention capacity of the soil. So investing in soil health indeed is not just for the carbon sequestration benefit, um, you know, but it's indeed also, I mean, to uh, invest in uh, adaptation, you know, and of course this is widely accepted and farmers are very keen to move forward on that. So for that reason, you know, to underscore what I said earlier, you know, I mean, my expectation is that the MRV type that we need for repurposing public support is a lower standard probably than what the private sector is looking for because focusing on soil health generates multiple benefits uh, that would be a very good justification to put public support behind it. Excellent. All right, Keith, one more and then we're going to need to um, take a break, which I'll speak about in a moment. So Keith, for you, what is the role of higher resolution and good quality environmental and soil data versus better quality activity data and reducing uncertainty at the project and regional scales? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I think um, the, I think the main distinction in a way that the, one of the really advantages to things like, you know, remote sensing or, or having, you know, cheap kind of sensors that, that may be available in the future is, is really you can gather a lot of, of data that is, um, that informs on on the processes, but you can you can gather that data inexpensively. I think with present technologies, it still costs in order to get high quality soil measurements. For the most part, you still have to do the kind of destructive sampling and lab processing. Uh, you know those technologies uh, for you know in situ measurements are probably going to. In, improve in, in the future, but it's still a very difficult task. So I think that's why you can't at present afford to do a huge amount of high quality soil measurements. So that's again, my, my advice is do, do those where you do them, do them well with the best technologies, have really high quality measurements, use it strategically, and then combine that with much cheaper 
granular information on activities, on remote sensing, and, and sort of put the two together. And I think models are, are the piece that, that comes in between those, really. So again, I think that kind of an integrated platform uh, is, is, is what can take us there. Excellent. Um, I thank the question curators. Those were all excellent questions. Thank you very much, um, Sanira and Kyle, for helping in that regard. We had some 70 questions more actually um, respond uh, that were posed. And as I said, we'll do our best to try to find a way to address those questions over time. So thank you all of the participants in the webinar for engaging in your questions and apologies for not getting to all the questions. We will take a break. We're right on time, thankfully. Um, so the break will go from five of the hour uh, right now till five after the hour. So we'll start up again at um, uh, five after the hour in the East Coast of the US. That'll be five after 11 where I am. And um, we'll keep this webinar open. We urge you to stay on and just, um, and panelists uh, go on uh, on mute and take your, uh, take your video off and We'll start right up at five after the hour. Thank you very much, everybody. Sorry, I was on mute asking for the slides to advance. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> of all things to be done uh, by the facilitator is be on mute. We all do it. Sorry about that. Um, so we have the next session here. Um, it's really a series of two, uh, two sessions um, on uh, the soil counting, soil carbon accounting frontiers. You see there in your screen, the the order of the presentations, um, and starting with Stefan Jerka from Vera, going on to Dan ha uh, Harburg from uh, the head of the Carbon Quantification Unit at Indigo, and from Dagon Incorporated, uh, we have Bill Salas, and from Nori Incorporated, we have Alden Donnelly. So without further ado, Stefan, uh, it's over to you. Great, thank you. Yeah, next slide, please. So my name is Stefan Yerka, and uh, thank you for the invitation today to speak to you about what uh, Vera is doing around development and management of standards and methodologies for sustainable ag and soil carbon accounting. Uh, next slide, please. So I will just speak briefly about Vera and what we do and then get into our uh, activities on this topic um, with respect to agriculture. So VERA is a nonprofit that catalyzes measurable climate action and sustainable development outcomes. We do that by uh, driving large-scale investments to activities that uh, reduce emissions, improve livelihoods, and protect nature. Uh, we have a number of, of standards and programs. Uh, you can see the, the symbols there for, for the various programs. The Verified Carbon Standard, which has been uh, mentioned a couple times already today, is our flagship uh, carbon accounting program, uh, but we are <coughs> increasing uh, diverse, diversifying into other spaces uh, that provide innovative solutions for people and the planet. Uh, next slide, please. So here you just uh, have a graphic that illustrates kind of our position globally in the, in the offsetting market. Um, this graphic shows uh, on the x-axis the, the last four or five years uh, and on the y-axis the volume of the carbon market. Uh, the different colors represent uh, different uh, either compliance or voluntary uh, carbon uh, markets and you can see that in uh, so, so VCS is the light blue color second down there. And you can see that in 2019 we actually became the world's largest carbon crediting mechanism uh, overtaking the CDM. Uh, so we are you know, primarily active in the voluntary space, but we do also uh, participate in uh, compliance markets, for example, in Colombia and uh, just recently in South Africa and, and the Corsia aviation market. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to begin just by giving you a, a little flavor of what we've done to date around ALM, agricultural land management projects in our BCS program. We have uh, around a dozen projects registered or in the pipeline. The uh, Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project uh, was mentioned uh, earlier as well by, by Martin. This is supporting tens of thousands of smallholder farmers with uh, diverse mixed cropping systems and estimated ERRs, emission reduction removals, uh, close to 100,000 tons annually. Uh, we have another project in Montana in the works in, in planning stages. This will cover around 15,000 hectares and introduce uh, improved grazing practices to dozens of participating ranchers. 
And uh, Deborah also mentioned earlier the, the Northern Kenya rang Rangelands Project, which is just getting off the ground, but is an exciting uh, initiative. But we recognize, you know, there's a lot more to do. A, a dozen projects aren't going to get us uh, nearly uh, all the way towards uh, climate goals. So next slide, please. Uh, with that in mind, we're taking a you know concerted effort to really scale up our uh, work around agriculture. We did this initially and are, are doing this by um, through the help of an expert ag land management working group. We convened this group uh, in early uh, earlier this year. This is made up a, of a mix of experts from different domains, um, and this group is exploring barriers and opportunities for. ALM, ALM activities that generate greenhouse gas mitigation benefits. Um, several of you um, uh, panelists are actually uh, members of this working group, so thank you very much for your participation. We've gleaned lots of already to date, lots of useful information and feedback from the group, and, and much of what I'll say uh, in, in the rest of the slides is, uh, it was from feedback uh, that this uh, group was able to offer. We're looking at uh, new accounting methodologies. Uh, you'll hear after my presentation from, from Indigo around the uh, methodology for improved ag land management that's in final stages of review. Um, we're looking to incorporate technology advances. So Keith uh, mentioned remote sensing for activity monitoring, for example, are very interested to see how that could be brought into accounting methodologies. And we recognize that our current rules um, around participation and project development, which are, are quite complex, um, uh, could be adapted, uh, better adapted to the operational realities of agriculture. And so we're, we're working to understand those uh, changes and, and implement them. Next slide, please. So what have we learned around constraints to agricultural project development? Uh, much of this, I think, will uh, have you, you'll have recognized this from earlier presentations. But uh, from our perspective, as a, a standard setter, we we know that agriculture and soils are are high, highly variable, right? And this means that there's a need for flexibility uh, in terms of how projects are developed and and greenhouse gases are quantified. Uh, current carbon prices relative to project development costs uh, can be prohibitive. So, you know, it takes quite a bit of uh, resources to develop carbon projects and the, the current prices sometimes uh, mean that the, the volumes generated don't uh, justify project development. Uh, that could evolve with the, the change in the carbon market dynamic. Behavior change uh, is complex, right? Farmers, especially in the aging farming populations, are sometimes reluctant to commit to long-term practice change. And so there's a need to really incentivize that the behavior change over time. <clears throat> Land tenure and carbon rights uh, are, of course, critical to carbon project development. Uh, in, in the global south, this can be a constraint uh, where sometimes land tenure is unclear. There is a need to uh, aggregate farms, so, so many farm operators into uh, a single project uh, to, to achieve economies of scale. This aggregation uh, brings all sorts of complexities given the, the differences in farming and, and farmer preference, et cetera. So a, a need to, uh, to really understand that constraint. Um, and lastly, uh, I think you know, we've, we've already heard around the complexities of uh, GHG quantification and, and the different approaches and sort of pros and cons um, and, you know, trying to um, unpack those and bring them to bear in uh, carbon uh, project development is important. Next slide, please. So what actions are we taking to overcome these constraints? Uh, well, this is a, a list of a few items, again, largely coming out of uh, feedback from our uh, expert working group, as well as other stakeholders. Um, it's not an exhaustive list. We have we have lots that we uh, more that we want to do, but uh, here are a few examples. So we're looking at uh, standardized methods to determine additionality. This would avoid the need for a project by project uh, approach to additionality determination and, and really streamline one aspect of project development. We are looking to adjust how uh, non-permanence risk is calculated and uh, by extension, the, uh, any 
uh, buffer credits that are deducted. Uh, we want to uh, look at our aggregation guidance and update it and refine it to, to make it uh, more specific and, and tailored to the, the ag land management sector. Uh, we're also exploring how some types of reversal risks, uh, for example, reversion to conventional tillage could be managed within the group uh, to maintain the integrity of, of the project. With respect to project longevity, we're looking at allowing for shorter duration projects at the instance level, that is at the, the individual farm level in a group project construct, as long as the entire project uh, maintains uh, the, the project longevity requirement, which currently is set at 30 years in the BCS program. And lastly, I want to mention that we are uh, anticipating forming and co-convening, uh, perhaps with some of the other standards bodies, a modeling expert advisory group that would really help us unpack and, and uh, provide a, a common basis and framework for using models in, in carbon project development and kind of best practices around that. So more to come on that. Next slide, please. You need to wrap up here, Steph. Thank you. Uh, what are some investments needed? Um, we're, we are thinking that expanded soils databases to set baselines could be really useful and avoid the need uh, for project by project uh, soils uh, sampling and measurement. Again, I, I mentioned these tech approaches and they've also been mentioned by previous presenters to lower MRV costs. Uh, models can be made accessible to uh, a range of users, um, would really allow uh, a diversity of project participants. And lastly, uh, I think others have mentioned as well, uh, capacity building for, uh, for project developers, particularly in the Global South. Uh, next slide. So quickly, just to wrap up here, uh, I've focused mostly on the VCS program. We do have uh, other uh, newer uh, programs and standards, the Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard that looks at the, the SDGs and how those could uh, be brought to bear on soil health and, and land scales, uh, another yeah. oil, uh, accounting framework. Thank you, I'll, I'll wrap it up there, apologies. Great, thank you, Stefan. Um, Dan, let's go right into your presentation here. Um, thank you very much, go right ahead. Sounds great. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. You can jump to the next slide here. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the research and entrepreneurial connection networks that Indigo is working on uh, as we look to, to launch our, our first year of our carbon program. So just a very brief overview. Indigo is a, a six-year-old company based in Boston. Our mission is to harness nature to help farmers sustainably leave the planet. We do that with sort of three fundamental pillars here at the company. We focus on farm profitability. Uh, we think about the sustainability and long-term sustainability of agriculture. And we think about the impacts of agricultural practices on consumer health. So if you jump to the next slide. So to give you a little bit of an overview of Indigo Carbon, um, we're developing a program that looks to uh, pay farmers, uh, ultimately transforming the lives of farmers in their communities by compensating them for uh, carbon farming practices. And so uh, as, a, as a part of that program, we're developing both the measurement and verification uh, tools. Uh, you heard from Stefan about the uh, protocol that, that we're working on with Vera. Uh, so there will be uh, internationally recognized protocols that, that these credits will be quantified under. And we'll be working directly with farmers uh, through our agronomy and, and on field networks uh, to support farmers through those transitions, both in practice changes, as well as other aspects of, of farm uh, change management. So if you jump to the next slide. Looks like some of our, our graphics disappeared, but that's all right. Um, so there are really four key components of, of this uh, marketplace that are advancing simultaneously for us. We think about the participation both from our, from our buyers uh, and from growers as being sort of the, the two pin, the two ends of, of the chain here. And then the two middle pieces, carbon quantification, which is the area that I focus on, uh, you know, credits need to be scientifically accurate and credible in order for buyers to trust them and in order for growers to get the most out of them. And the costs need to be as low as they possibly can be, and they need to decline over time in order for these markets to be able to advance properly. So I'm gonna talk about those two components as we move forward. But the regenerative product side of this is also really critical and is an area where we think uh, Indigo is, is positioned to, to really help farmers take advantage of these programs. 
a grower needs to understand uh, you know, the, how to navigate the complex world of decisions in order to maximize their overall profitability, taking carbon into consideration, which is not something that farmers have really thought about in the past. And so we need to be able to deploy the optimal sequence of practice changes <clears throat> at the farm level in order to minimize burdens on growers from a data collection perspective, from a change management perspective, and maximize their potential outcome. So we, we focus on, on that as well as a company. Go to the next slide here. So our program really covers the end to end from helping growers through online portals and enrolling in our, our offset program, uh, establishing baselines, helping with the transition and practices, doing a combination of manual data gathering with growers uh, through to automated data collection, whether that's from remote sensing, government sources, uh, you know, directly off of machine equipment, et cetera, uh, all the way through processing, uh, processing that data through uh, a, a series of tools that will give us estimates for, uh, for soil carbon sequestration, for nitrous oxide emissions reduction, for methane reductions, uh, and for on-farm emissions reductions from equipment. Uh, and so we're looking at essentially, you know, crediting a combination of, of sequestration and abatement opportunities that would then uh, get turned into offsets that are, that are verified and validated and then sold on to the buyers. And so, you know, we, we are doing everything uh, together with farmers in terms of both measuring initial carbon stocks to help set baselines for that project and, and the data collection through to um, the, the sale and aggregation of those, of those credits. Go to the next slide. So Stefan mentioned this, uh, but we're working with Vera. We're also working with Climate Action Reserve to develop global methodologies that are scalable, accurate, and flexible to try to represent our, our projects as accurately as possible and uh, to try to generate as many credits for the, the best possible farm outcomes as we can. And so for us, that means uh, trying to pool as many growers across the nation as possible in a, in a portfolio project that is verified at the portfolio level grouping these growers um, into different strata depending upon the outcomes that they're experiencing and the practices that they're implementing doing a combination of sampling and modeling in order to you know, i think keith Poston did a great job of describing some of the challenges associated with uh, you know high costs and sampling um, there are trade-offs of course with with model only approaches so we've fused those two together uh, and then we're developing an approach that allows for uh, iteration of, of models. You heard Stefan talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the the need for sort of model guidance to be a part of the way that the uh, the registry bodies uh, interact in the space going forward because there's so much work that's developing in that space. We see that as really critical to enabling the continued success and lower costs and, and higher credit projection capabilities of these markets. So for us, those are really the, the three critical components of, of the market. If you jump to the next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about two other kind of core features of uh, what Indigo is doing in this space to try to push forward. Uh, one of those is on participation of startups and, and new technologies, and the other is on the, the research uh, in, into soil carbon science. So uh, we launched a program about a year ago to try to look at solutions from the entrepreneurial world that could help us to accelerate carbon sequestration better quantify it and also look for alternative ways to reward growers for changes uh, in their in their soil carbon and on-farm emissions. So if you jump to the next slide, you'll see that we we worked with a we ended up choosing about 30 companies from across the country across the world uh, over from over 260 applicants. Uh, these companies are developing solutions across those three different spaces. <clears throat> and we're now in the process of working to evaluate these technologies and determine uh, a set of winners within each of those categories. Uh, but really, you know, more so than, than anything else, this program has allowed us to bring together an entrepreneurial community that are trying to work in this space, have them interact together uh, with one another, interact with us and some of the data that are coming off of our, of our early trials and better understand where their, their place may be in, in carbon markets more broadly. So it's been a, a wonderful opportunity for us. You know, we think that there should be thousands of companies, not just hundreds, who are, who are working in this space and developing new technologies. So we're excited to continue to participate in that community discussion going forward. The second piece I mentioned is, is around our experimental efforts. So we kicked off a set of experiments here in the US uh, last year 
looking at, at trying to uh, enrich our, our overall scientific understanding of the potential for agricultural soils to sequester carbon and, and to abate emissions. And recognizing that the, the science is, is still, you know, still has quite a bit of development that's needed here in order for us to, um, to, uh, to, to really understand what the optimal set of practice are, practices are for each individual farmer and what the outcomes are that they can achieve. And so we've been looking at collecting a number of direct measurements uh, from these farm sites, uh, soil carbon of bulk density, uh, measuring down to deep depths, um, looking at, at uh, a number of different uh, types of, of tests and analyses, and then also looking at economic uh, interviews with growers to understand profitability, um, and of course, looking at, at the microbial communities and soils as well. So if you jump to the next slide, you know, we're starting to get some of our, our, uh, our first samples back, which has been extremely exciting. You, know, you see here on the right, some of the first samples we collected were from fields uh, across, across the country that really had a range in both years of, of implementing practices like cover cropping and no-till. And we were able to complete uh, 59 observational study fields uh, worth of, of work uh, thus far. On the next slide, you'll see that we're, um, you know, we're, we're now looking in this, this second year of this study uh, to do a number of side-by-side -side comparisons where we look at control versus treatments. But these are not sort of one treatment versus one control. Uh, this, is, this is systems approaches that we're trying to do research in. So we're looking at combinations of things like no-till and cover crop and reductions in inputs. How, do that, how does that outcome compare to a, a conventionally treated farm? And, and we're working uh, with a number of university uh, and NGO partners uh, to help both design these studies, uh, collect the data, and then analyze the data, and then thinking about how that data set can be used for both peer-reviewed publications, uh, as well as making improvements in, in our modeling capabilities or, or other ways to, to benefit the broader community. So we see this as a really critical part of, um, of how a for-profit company can contribute uh, in this space, and also a really critical part of standing up new markets in, in carbon. So thank you for the time. Great, thank you, Dan. Thank you uh, for keeping on time. And Bill, Silas, over to you, please. Thank you, Tim, and um, go to the next slide. Uh, thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to give a little insight into what we're doing at Dagan. Dagan is a company whose mission is to help build the business case for soil health. I think we all know, you know why we're having these discussions because, you know, globally, for example, we're losing 24 billion tons of soil a year through erosion. Um, we've lost anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the organic matter in agricultural soils globally, so it's a critical issue. I think as we think through how to unlock private and public sector finance and investment in soil health, we need to be able to A, set the baseline. Where are we now in terms of soil health conditions globally? What are the practices that have been implemented uh, historically and currently that improve the baseline on soil health and trends over time? We've had many speakers talk about the need for MRV systems to track soil health outcomes. Um, as a way of quantifying the, the outcomes to potentially monetize that in a different financial mechanisms. And then lastly, we need a sort of a third party independent approach for verifying those practices that results in enhancements in soil carbon. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that these finance approaches and markets have really had significant barriers. It's been too expensive to actually quantify carbon outcomes. Yes, it's very expensive to measure, as Keith outlined. The models are getting better, but we need, again, improvements in the models to quantify outcomes at field to regional scale. The transaction costs for verification for markets has been too expensive. It's too expensive to send someone out to verify that, yes, that farmer implemented cover cropping or has been doing no-till. So we need to find out mechanisms and technologies for reducing those verification costs. In addition, the tools for monitoring and quantification you know, are coming out of the research environment. And as such, they're really difficult to scale if we're going to address soil health at, at a global scale. So it's clear we need to remove these barriers to be able to measure to monetize. If you go to the next slide, um, a key focus at Dagan is to do sort of two aspects of this and be, try to become a third party data provider to facilitate investment in soil health. One is the operational use of remote sensing to track ag management at field to regional scales, including 
an ability to do retrospective analyses and longitudinal analyses to understand where we are now, and that's through the Optus platform. And the other is to then try to model outcomes, work with the field scientists to do extensive validation and improvement in the models, to then quantify outcomes to support the finance and market use of these data. If we go to the next slide, a quick overview. So Optus basically operational system, it tracks tillage information, crop residue management, cover cropping. But in addition to just saying cover cropped or not, the impact of cover cropping, for example, depends on how rigorous that cover crop grows, how long is it, you know, from emergence to termination in terms of protecting the soil, reducing soil erosion, enhancing organic matter inputs for soil carbon stock outcomes. DNDC is a soil biogeochemical model that's been around. It's DNDC and Day Center sort of heavily researched tools that have been shown to be able to quantify greenhouse gas emissions. You know, the soil carbon science is evolving and the models need to evolve as we get better understanding. But DNDC is basically a soil biogeochemical model that translates management information with soil information, with climate information to look at greenhouse gas emissions, soil carbon. And together we can provide um, the users of these technologies sort of detailed insights and analytics. If we go to the next slide, just to sort of highlight the scale at which these data can be applied. The panel on the left is um, a satellite based estimate of residue cover at one particular time. The darker green areas are high residue cover, the browner areas are, are low residue cover. So we can use that and track it on an every few day basis to track residue dynamics and to infer tillage practices. So the center panel basically uses the USDA NRCS definitions of tillage practices, which are based on percent residue fraction at, at crop emergence to estimate conventional till from reduced till from, from no till. Um, in, in reality, we actually have a continuous estimate. We then link that with the soil modeling to look at you know, trends in soil carbon stock over time. If we go to the next slide, um, this just highlights the panel on the bottom, sort of the real barriers for carbon markets. In the past, the costs of creating the market, transacting the, the market, and verifying the outcomes consumed almost all of the value of the carbon. Right? So there's nothing left for the grower. The grower has to have the economic viability of these programs if we're ever going to get things at scale. So it's clear that we need new technologies to do this, including remote sensing, developments of, of models with detailed validation to you know, remove this challenge that ecosystem service markets have been, been burdened with. If we go to the, the next slide, another value of these technologies is actually to understand risk. So this analysis we did was we looked at acres that were unable to plant in 2019 due to a very wet spring, so heavy flooding. You know, the ongoing working hypothesis is as you, and we know, as you increase soil organic matter, you improve water infiltration. So with the satellite platforms, we took a look at three different counties that had high claims of prevent plant. And we said, you know, for those that were successfully planted versus not, so we used the satellite monitoring to say, yes, this field was successfully planted, this was not. We then looked at the historic adoption of conservation across those different cohorts, the prevent plant and successful plant. And what was statistically clear was that the successful plant fields had adopted conservation practices more intensively historically. This is just an you know, initial analysis, but it's unlocking the kind of data that we need to help motivate and bring finance to address soil health, whether it's through crop insurance, innovative crop insurance, or direct financing. We go to the next slide. So what are the next steps? You know, demonstrate these technologies and, and remove additional barriers to make these ecosystem service markets work for growers. As Keith mentioned, we need improvements in soil carbon measurements and, and you know, we need to sort of intensify how we do the measurements at Sentinel sites and then use that data to improve modeling and other quantification approaches. So we're working closely with the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium and recently a new award with the Department of Energy to sort of improve those measurement approaches. Then we actually need to get out and, and do pilots to motivate the, financer, the financing ideas. So we're working on you know, drilling down on that 2019 prevent plant to understand the actuarial risk of adoption of conservation versus not as we get to a more varied climate. And then lastly, engage with the land value sector to understand that soil health is capital. 
the value of the soil is important from a land value perspective and to engage um, the ESG reporting to engage large corporations to also en enhance finance of these practices. And on the last slide, um, it's just there's, you know, there's a business case for every stakeholder involved in agriculture. The farmer has to be at the center of it. They have to have the economic value and incentive to make this market work for all of the stakeholders to address and motivate and, and, and unlock the finances sitting on the edges of, of agriculture right now, really looking for a solution to enhance soil health, address crop resilience, livelihoods, and climate change. Thanks, with that, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, and thanks for making up a bit of time there. But Alden, over to you quickly. Hi, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to maybe skip past some of my slides. Um, when we were invited to speak here, all of us were, were invited to um, comment on what we're doing that's controversial. And nobody's done that so far. So I'm going to try to jump to that just because I'm a troublemaker by nature. Um, so uh, my first request is please everybody who might be interested, check out the Nori website. Um, and when you uh, download this, uh, this webinar, you'll see uh, the, the link to do so. Uh, what Nori is doing is trying to create a market with the, our primary goal initially was to, to create the first market in the world where there is true carbon price discovery. Um, there is a lot of discussion about prices in the other markets, but uh, price discovery is not robust or, or transparent. Often price values that are marked to market are reported as actual prices paid and, and that's not accurate reporting. So we thought let's build a market. Um, when we went to build a market, we uh, thought that we would start with protocols that have been approved in existing registries select some and make those the standard that we use to uh, launch our market. Our market is also um, unique in that we are a dedicated carbon removal marketplace. We're starting with um, the carbon removal and retention services that food and fiber producers can deliver, but we hope to expand to have methodologies to list any form of carbon removal and retention um, service. Uh, we found that um, we could not proceed with the, um, uh, any of the protocols that are on existing registries for a number of reasons, including but not limited to the fact that most um, uh, carbon offset credits that trade um, a, uh, are, um, are double counted and double credited and we have a single crediting, single uh, counting standard for our marketplace and there were other issues so we found we had to create our own methodology. In our methodology we found we um, learned from other markets that we had to deal with permanence differently, additionality differently. Um, uh, we also formed the opinion that the right way of doing things does not, re in fact is not prescribing practices but getting to outcomes as efficiently as possible. And um, uh, the other thing that's controversial is we think it's essential that this market derive for food and fiber producers new revenues from outside the food supply chain. So um, uh, uh, worldwide, whether you're in the developed or developing economies, for some reason, consumers do not pay for their food and their clothing prices sufficient to cover the full cost of producing the food and fiber they rely on. And so government subsidies exist everywhere. I, I'm actually not sure why that's true, but it's true everywhere. And we think it's essential that as we move on to paying food and fiber producers for delivering ecosystem services, we exploit this opportunity to bring revenues from not just, yes, from inside the food supply chain, but also outside the food supply chain. Um, uh, I, it's probably, in our view, unrealistic to expect that food and fiber producers will get paid the full value of ecosystem services in the food supply chain when they're not already not getting paid the full value of their services when they're delivering food and fiber. Uh, in the Nori marketplace, one Nori carbon removal ton, our credit, 
represents one incremental ton of CO2 removed from the atmosphere and the um, land owner or operator's commitment that the recovered carbon will be restored in a natural or man-made terrestrial reservoir for at least 10 years. So that's our first controversial decision. We looked at um, all of the uh, covenants related to carbon sequestration protocols that exist uh, that are used to uh, represent the commitment to permanence not with a view to criticize them, but to find the best language and discovered that it's not perhaps correct to suggest that any of those covenants actually deliver the promise of permanence. And we dove into that and realized that, you know, the real issue here is we're asking landowners to provide a new service, a, a, carbon, a carbon warehousing service. And the existing protocols essentially are asking landowners to make a hundred year commitment in exchange for maybe seven to 30 years worth of compensation. And so we're trying to communicate that if you want permanence, you better buy the, the equivalent of permanence is 10 NRTs or get used to the idea that if you're asking landowners to deliver the service for extended periods, they're going to need recurring revenues um, if, if for no other reason to cover the continuing monitoring, verification and reporting costs that go with proving they're meeting the permanence requirement. So we are, we really believe permanence is an important objective. We also believe that it's probably inappropriate to communicate to the buyers that for seven to 30 years of compensation, they can get a hundred to a thousand years worth of permanence. Uh, so so I'll, maybe I'll move on from there. Um, next slide. Well, then I'm a little concerned about time because there's several yeah. slides, so it's yeah. not clear which ones you're going to use. So, so just, just keep, move on from there. Um, just I uh, wanted you to look at this slide. This is by the FAO. Um, uh, a not perfect, but a, a decent proxy for the potential for sequestering incremental carbon is this slide. As Bill mentioned, uh, the science believes that we've depleted uh, carbon stocks in our topsoil over the last 300 years by 50 to 70 percent. And that's a general proxy for the capacity of the land to, to uh, build, build back up carbon stocks. So our focus, our initial focus is on these 10 countries that account for more than 60% of global carbon stocks. We've uh, launched in the United States a pilot and we are um, hoping to move into Canada and Brazil and elsewhere uh, within the next uh, 18 months. N next slide. Um, just to show you this is there, won't go through it. The, these are our estimates of the carbon storage potential for the United States. Um, and we have further detailed break it down so that we work with that are by county in the United States. Anybody wants to talk to us about that can. Next slide. Um, can skip this slide because of time. Uh, skip this slide. Just know it's there. Uh, we um, are the first uh, uh, what we'd call retail carbon market in the world where small buyers can directly purchase from our site, don't have to go through brokers. Our, um, we're just a young pilot. Our sales to date are um, anecdotal evidence because the, the, the volume is not large enough to be you know, statistically valid yet. But to date, buyers have paid over our marketplace uh, 1650 to 1725 a ton equivalent uh, for carbon re for, for the carbon removal credits we issue called NRTs. Uh, roughly 16,000 have sold um, our backed. We have a backlog of demand for NRTs that's greater than our um, existing um, uh, issued supply. And we have a backlog of between uh, 250,000 and 400,000 pre-qualified uh, NRT supplies that we're working through the enrollment pipeline at this point in time. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's, that's checking us out. And um, I think I'm out of time, yeah. but I do encourage everybody to debate permanence. Um, what, what are alternatives to prescribing practices? I, we think there's something that's halfway between practice and outcome that we're calling indicators. And we're working with some experts right now 
to figure out what might be the, the set of indicators that we might introduce uh, to, to be proxies for outcomes that is not prescribing practices. And I'd love anybody to uh, work on that with us who's interested. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Alden. Um, and uh, thank you for keeping on time and modifying your presentation to make the points that you've made and, uh, and interject that point of view that you did. I'm gonna pose the first question here uh, to Stefan. Um, Stefan, does aggregation help in reducing <laughs> transactions? Does aggregation help? Uh, Alden, maybe you can mute while, uh, there you go, thank you. Does aggregation help in reducing transaction costs for carbon projects? If yes, by how much? Yeah, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I think it's hard to put a specific uh, number on how much. Um, you know, as uh, you bring in additional uh, farms, um, you can design sampling approaches that, that look at, uh, you know, subsets of, of those farms um, and bring down costs. But um, I think putting a, a specific number on that, um, you know, it, it's not something we've looked at specifically, but certainly, you know, the, the, the grouped project and the aggregation, um, the ability to aggregate uh, exists within the rules for specifically this reason to, to um, be more cost efficient. Great, and um, I'm gonna pose a question to each of you, then a general question, and if you guys can be as concise as possible, we can do a second round like we did last time. So Dan, for you, assuming it's a work in progress, when and under what conditions do you foresee, hang on, I gotta get my screen a little bigger here. Um, do you foresee the model catching up with the accuracy of direct measurement? What is more, what more is needed? Additional sampling to increase the data set or some, something else? Great question. Um, well, direct sampling, direct measurement in the field uh, can have a, a huge range of accuracies, as you can imagine. It's not just there's not no single number that that sort of corresponds to a, a direct sample. Depending on the number of samples you take in the field, you could be very accurately or inaccurately representing a, a soil. So, I, I wouldn't I would say it's hard to compare where models are to direct sampling given those variations. But no question, we need more We need more measurements in the field and we need more measurements over time. And we need more measurements at deeper depths. I think particularly one of the areas that is most important for us in, in the scientific community as well right now is to understand um, you know, how carbon is, is actually integrating into the, the deeper soil layers and how carbon is moving throughout the soil layers, especially as farmers are changing their practices uh, in, in, in more drastic ways. So you know, that's an area where I think models need to, to be improved um, and an area that we, we need more direct measurements in order to feed, uh, feed to those models. Excellent. And uh, on the screen is a little tutorial about where you submit your questions, but quite a few have been submitting them. So thank you for that. Um, Bill, to you, what are the current gaps where companies can provide solutions to operationalize your methodologies? Um, I, I think the, the, the current gaps are sort of twofold. One is a technological um, gap, which is to directly link these, these data approaches to the workflows for companies, because I think if we're really going to engage companies, it has to be a seamless integration with their workflows to participate in, in either the financing side of aspects or, or the market side. The other is, you know, as people have mentioned, we need additional validation data so that when we say, you know, the model, the remote sensing model or the soil model says X, what are the associated uncertainties in those quantification estimates? Because then the market will deal with that uncertainty. We, we don't have to be afraid of uncertainty. We just have to quantify it. And then the finance and the markets will, will figure out how best to account for that uncertainty in their programs. Great. Um, and this kind of relates to a general question I'll try to pose to all the panelists in a moment here. But um, Alden, you mentioned that uh, most carbon offset credits that trade are double counted and or double credited. Can you explain how this is the case? In um, all existing voluntary and compliance markets, uh, if I, you emit 10 and you want to buy minus, real interest in minus two, and I emit 10 and offer to sell you real interest in minus two, in all of those markets, after I sell you real interest in minus two and our combined emissions went from 20 to 18, um, in every context, 
you then you report your net emissions as eight and I report my net emissions as eight. There is no requirement in any existing registry or protocol for me to add a balancing entry and report my inventory to reflect the transaction. So in every market, including compliance markets, if it's traded, it's counted twice. Okay. Um, anybody, any other panelists want to react to that? Stefan? Yeah, well, I know colleagues of mine on Vera have, have looked at that and we're participating in a, a working group on double counting. I mean, this is a, a serious concern. Um, you know, it's hard for me to comment on the specifics of, of what Alden just framed up there, but you know, it is something we are concerned about. And I think from, from our perspective, um, you know, we, none of our credits are traded in other um, uh, carbon, carbon uh, registries, right? Like the VCS uh, uh, credit is, is unique um, and it's, it, it's in fact uh, prohibited from being uh, listed on a different registry. Okay, my suggestion is we'll go to a general comment, a general question here, and each of you, if you could quickly respond, and Bill, as I was alluding to earlier, I think you've already started to address this question, but how do you calculate the risk of soil organic carbon impermanence and reflect this in the financial payments? Uh, well, that's, that's, that's tricky. I mean, um, we can begin to understand how these soil health systems are implemented at scale by having data from uh, satellite sources where we can look at sort of the history of adoption of these practices, right? So one of the tenets is over time, the economic benefits of those practices will help facilitate continued use. So with the satellite approach, we can do an inventory to understand, for example, one, once a grower converts to no-till, what's the likelihood that they'd actually move out of that system to help understand the risks of conversion? Um, but there are also other financial levers that can reduce that risk further. Dan, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think from our perspective, um, it's really important to, this is one of the reasons why it's sort of having an aggregated project is so important, because I think we could see that there could be reversals or impermanence, you know, affecting specific farmers. But, you know, for us, aggregating that over a portfolio ensures that, that buyers are at least be, can be made whole um, in projects. Not only that, but we also need to continue to monitor soil carbon stocks over time in the project to make sure that we're accounting for changes, um, you know, and ensuring that the, the credit issuances are, are in line with, uh, with with those accounting uh, for any uh, for any reversal. So it's a, it's certainly a critical thing from my perspective. We'd love to and we'd love to better understand how to push farmers into practices that have, that avoid those reversals. But there are plenty of instruments to, to help manage them, uh, nevertheless. Okay, thank you, Alden, to you, and then Stefan. Alden? Uh, so, um, and in our marketplace, Norig makes a guarantee to buyers that that carbon will be retained and we have to um, go to the market and buy and retire supplemental NRTs if there is carbon loss. We enter into a contract with the supplier, which under some circumstances will enable us to recover our costs from the supplier under, uh, but there's a generous force majeure clause where there, where, where, we will be bearing the risk. In that, we, we've done a lot of analysis. We know that um, for the best possible um, land manager, it'll take typically 12 to 20 years to complete a full transition to what we think of as comprehensive regenerative ag. We know the risk um, that they'll bail um, away from those practices is at least 50% between years three and five when they're feeling the maximum financial distress, which we hope will be addressed by the establishment of a reliable carbon market. We know that um, that very high risk of carbon loss uh, between years three and five declines precipitously between years seven to 12. We're in pretty safe ground after year 12 and we're in really safe ground by year 20. Thank you, Stefan, any thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Just real quick, um, I would echo what Dan said. Uh, th I think the group uh, project construct allows for the management of, of risk um, so that, you know, ind individual instances can, uh, of reversal to tillage, let's say, can be offset by, uh, you know, other farmers that are, are not doing that. Um, we 
are wanting to take a closer look at how this is uh, assessed in in through our um, AFLU non-permanence risk tool. We actually have a consultancy open um, just launching now to look specifically at, at how agricultural risk is assessed um, and you know the associated um, buffer deduction. So we have a uh, essentially an insurance pool um, that uh, will allow for um, you know credits to be released if there is a significant reversal. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. The, um, I'm going to keep with you with a question, and we'll try to do one question each for each of the panelists. Squeeze that in the remaining five minutes that we have here. So please be brief in your responses. Um, so Stefan, what is the ex estimated cost of carbon accounting using existing or the current expected methodologies and will this be lower with new uh, uh, methodologies coming online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, thank you, great question. Um, hard to put in a specific number on the existing costs, again, given sort of the diversity of uh, agricultural systems, locations, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the requirements to develop a project, whether it's uh, accessible, um, the scale of it, etc. Um, but our, our hope and our intent absolutely is to bring costs down through many of these solutions that have been discussed already. So, you know, the, the emerging technologies, remote sensing, um, you know, enhanced models that are accessible um, to, to a range of users, I think you know in aggregate these kinds of solutions will um, allow uh, for for better cost efficiencies um, and, and so that's what we are exploring great okay um, Dan how do farmers cover their first investments required to implement activities that would result in carbon capture and carbon credits is there a way for them to have access to carbon related capital uh, before generating the credits yeah that's a great question um, th there certainly are ways to explore this. I mean, it, it highly depends upon how many practices a grower may be implementing in their first year of these types of projects, uh, you know, in terms of how much capital they need, right? If they're ceasing a behavior and that's their practice change versus if they're, say, planting a new cover crop or something like that for the first time and they need access to equipment and access to the seed itself. We are exploring ways to um, to, to issue prepayments in certain cases to uh, to try to help with some of that upfront capital. Uh, and we're also trying to make uh, other sources of capital accessible to farmers who, who join our programs because we see, you know, we see switching costs as a really important thing to help manage. Excellent. Um, okay, uh, Bill, uh, given Dagan's fo follows a high tech approach, what are your thoughts on how could millions of subsistence farmers in the global south be part of these new developments? Yeah, um, that, that's a great question. So a couple things in terms of sort of the role of the remote sensing technology, there are, you know, issues with, especially as we get into the tropics with persistent cloud cover, there are remote sensing technologies that can remove this problem with synthetic aperture radar, which will image through the clouds and be able to give information on, this, on the surface conditions. The, the, the harder piece is the, the subsistence agriculture, the scale of which those practices are implemented, tend to be at a scale that's finer than the operational satellite platforms. So I think what we're going to have to do is sort of Martin outlined, we're going to have to not, you know, worry too much about being perfect on what we're doing, but provide a solution that's sufficient to help subsistence producers participate in these, in these market opportunities. But it, it's a tricky, tricky question. Yeah, understood, and uh, thank you for your response. Alden, last question for the moment here to you is, if the NRT has a 10-year duration, how do you avoid different, a different kind of double counting where buyers buy the same sequestered carbon over and over again every 10 years? Well, uh, we're a blockchain-based uh, market for a number of reasons, and one yeah. is that um, all of the NRTs issued and carbon removal claims rewarded on our marketplace will be um, uh, fully documented in the public domain. Um, as long as an operator is under contract with us, our verifier, the verifier provides us assurance that the real interest in the carbon removal claim has not been double sold. And if and when a operator leaves our market, the permanent record of his um, new carbon stock and, and carbon removal sales 
uh, will be maintained on the blockchain. So we cannot stop other markets from allowing double selling, but we will make sure other markets can always see the information they need to prevent double selling. Great. Thank you, uh, panelists, for excellent presentations and for really doing a great job on answering these really well-framed questions from our attendees. We will now take another 10-minute break. It's top of the hour, 12 noon here in Eastern United States, and we'll be back online at 10 after. Um, and we'll do another panel just like this, and then we'll have some closing remarks from, from Paul Liu from Cut Per Mill. All right, so see you in 10 minutes. Thanks, Debbie. Beverly, Pamela, and Ronald, if you could come off video, uh, come on to video, excuse me, so you can signal to me that you're ready and we'll start in about a minute. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Pamela. And Ronald, there we go, great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna wait until my computer clock, there it is, 12.10. Okay, let's, um, Let's go ahead and get started. So we have uh, another series of four uh, presentations, um, 10 minutes each, and then followed by a Q&A, and then we'll have some closing remarks from Paul Liu. So um, Debbie Reed, please take it away. Thanks so much, Tim, and, and thanks to all the presenters who went um, before me. Um, if you could go to my next slide, please. So I wanna talk about ESMC and what we're doing and how we're doing it, and then get to how we're quantifying soil carbon. Our mission is to drive soil health systems and soil carbon sequestration at scale. Our theory of change is that a market that is properly designed for the agricultural sector can meet both societal and co corporate demand for ecosystem services assets, as well as, um, as sorry, for improved soil carbon sequestration, reduce net greenhouse gases, water quality and water quantity simultaneously. To overcome um, challenges, we're investing in a programmatic infrastructure to cost-effectively scale the market. Next slide, who we are, we're an agent of change. Our function is to create and provide the tools and the science-based standard-based program that quantifies, verifies, and certifies outcomes in order to pay farmers and ranchers for their impact on the ground. As a nonprofit, our proceeds cover our costs our research and development program is focused on dropping quantification, verification, and certification costs in order to maximize the profit going back to the farmers and ranchers who actually implement the change. If you go to our next slide, we started by reimagining ecosystem service markets conceived and designed for agriculture. Back in 2017, we started with an assessment of existing markets, protocols, tools, methodologies, models, etc. And then we documented points of failure, points of risk, challenges and obstacles. And then we spent 2018 des designing a fit for purpose program to overcome the challenges we saw so that we knew we were creating a long-term viable market um, that would help to solve climate change. While we know that speed and scale are critical to solve the climate challenge, we're committed to due diligence and ensuring that we get this right. Go to our next slide. Um, this shows we launched in 2019 as a public-private partnership that spans, as you see, the entire agricultural value chain and supply chain. Our members are co-investing with us in testing and refining our market and ensuring that the market functions as intended and meets market standards, meets buyer needs, but most importantly, works for farmers and ranchers first and foremost, with whom, without whom we can't actually uh, create a market. All of these members are collaborating with us to test right now the stack, credit mark, uh, stack crediting approach and the entire market. So we're testing enrollment, we're testing credit transactions, the entire MRV process and program um, as we quantify, verify, and then certify assets. You go to our, our next slide here. As part of the consortium that we launched in 2018, we also launched an ecosystem service market research consortium, also public-private partnership, in which all of the members you saw on the previous slide are co-investing with us in a national scale, harmonized, technologically advanced market. Um, that infrastructure that we're creating reduces the burden, uh, it reduces investment requirements and reduces the risk to all of the market participants. 
we take on the MRV and certification requirements working with gold standard and sustained cert. And again, we provide just the tools and the entry points for buyers and sellers. If you click one more time, the research partnership um, includes all of these members as well as the United States Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy um, ARPA-E program. And if you click the next one, um, it's backed by a three-year $10.3 million grant from the Foundation for Food and Ag Research, which we're matching with private donations, member dues, as well as um, philanthropic funding from others. I'll also note that our research consortium uh, includes four technical research working groups um, that are populated by independent nationally recognized science advisors, there's three per working group, as well as member representatives. This slide and my final slide talking about what we're doing um, explains um, that we've been adapting our protocols across each of 12 regions, which are designated according to USDA land resource regions, overlaid with crop production. Uh, if you go back to that slide, overlaid with crop production zones. For each region, we calibrate and validate our quantification tools and uh, before we actually go out and start piloting. And this shows where we have launched pilots as well as where um, we're about to announce pilots and where planning and emerging pilots are coming up. Next slide, um, getting to the details of how we quantify assets and, and um, credits in our market. Right now we do require soil carbon sampling at enrollment and every five years um, for engagement in our program. And at, uh, I think all of the experts who talked to this previously explained why. Our soil sampling protocol was designed by one of our technical working groups. And that working group is comprised of soil scientists from USDA, the Soil Health Institute, land grant universities, and others. And the sampling protocol requires stratification at the field, farm, and project scale and randomized sampling to ensure that um, we're proper, properly establishing soil organic carbon baselines and then can measure changes in carbon stocks over time. The standard sampling protocol is 30 centimeters, but in some systems, um, such as in our, our Southern Great Plains project, we kicked off in 2019, we actually sampled down to 60 centimeters because these are deep-rooted soil, um, uh, native prairie grasses with deep-rooted um, soils or deep-rooted deep -rooted systems where we know carbon is actually migrating and being accumulated deeper in the profile. Um, we also utilize the DNDC biogeochemical process model and Bill Dagan's, uh, Bill uh, Stalas from Dagan uh, spoke about that, as well as his work with Optus, which is another part of our greenhouse gas quantification and verification approach. Um, we do calibrate and validate the, the model and then utilize the measured soil organic carbon to actually track soil organic carbon over time. Our goal in all of this is really understanding that we need more accurate, more granular, more robust actual soil organic carbon to improve the science, the model function, and the credibility. But we're not stopping here. If you go to the next slide, um, I'll talk about some of the investments that we're making to ensure that we can drop the costs and the requirements over time. Uh, the, the, this slide shows some of the flavor of the investments we're making. Um, so for instance, we're, uh, we have put out RFPs to develop a stratification app to reduce the costs and uh, ease the sampling stratification so that we can generate um, randomized soil sampling at the project and field scale. We've also investing in multiple new soil carbon sampling tools, including neutron scattering, vis and IR, handheld spectrometers, et cetera. And that is three part. Currently, we're assessing the accuracy, the precision, and the repeatability of those tools. Um, we're also field testing them on the pilots that I described. And after we do that, we will look at the um, cost benefit assessment of these tools to help us with a, additional soil carbon uh, measurement in the field and their commercialization. We're also looking at alternative soil sampling stratification approaches out on the pilots so that we can continue to um, improve the precision, the accuracy, the repeatability, but drop the cost over time. Um, our ongoing R&D includes not just the technical working groups, but others really looking at how do we continue to just uh, improve the rigor of the entire system and uh, create cost-effective scalability efforts. Go to the next slide. 
Um, this one really talks about what our platform, our MRV platform uh, is di designed to do over time. He pointed out that a, a platform and an MRV platform that integrates measurement, modeling and activity um, will enable us to really get to where we need to go. And that is the point of our platform. Uh, we're able to track impacts at the field, the farm, the supply shed and various uh, watershed scales over time so that we can use trend data to show the benefits, the economics, we can show temporal and geographic and production um, type variability. And over time, we can tell which systems and which activities move the needle the most in soil carbon, net greenhouse gases, water quality, and water quantity. And then lastly, we've started investing in a new biodiversity credit, given that there's demand for that. Um, and we're starting that in one of our technical working groups. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, and thank you for keeping right on time. Um, and just remind people when you're posing questions in the Q&A, please make it clear um, who you're posing the question to. Um, and we'll go through a Q&A session in a moment here. Beverly, please come off, uh, please turn your video on. Thank you, you're up. Okay. Thanks, Tim, and um, thanks for the opportunity to participate. Um, this will be a necessarily broad overview of the experience from implementation in Australia of a legislated method for quantifying, quantifying sequestration soil carbon projects in agricultural land. Next slide, thanks. Um, introducing the policy and technical settings are helpful here to understand this method. Um, a core element of Australia's climate change policy is the Emissions Reduction Fund. It's a voluntary scheme that aims to uh, provide incentives for organisations and individuals to adopt new, new practices and technologies uh, to reduce emissions or increase removals. By undertaking el eligible activities, participants in the scheme can earn car Australian carbon credit units with one unit equal to one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent abatement. And this is what I'll refer to as a carbon credit throughout this talk. I'll speak mainly to the ERF crediting component, which establishes the rules, the reporting and auditing procedures for eligible activities in the legislated method, methodology, which we, we refer to as a method. To meet the scheme objectives, a method cannot be made into law unless it complies with a set of offsets, integrity standards that ensure that the, abate, the abatement is real, additional and measurable. As an indication of scale, the value of contracted abatement across all sectors is now about 2.3 billion Australian dollars, roughly 1.7 billion US, with soil carbon projects being a small but growing contribution and one attracting really wide interest from farmers to policy. Next slide, thanks. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, the offsets integrity standards require each method under the law to be based on sound scientific evidence. And the methods for crediting soil carbon are underpinned by a large, oh, sorry, one back, um, by a large investment in soil sampling and research across much of the country. So of course we, um, we always need more data. There are always gaps. There are two soil carbon methods currently available under Australia's legislation, a model-based method and a, a measurement-based method. Next, please. In addition to having a focus on integrity, development of the methods considers how practical, practical and usable the rules and requirements are for participants, which in a voluntary scheme is critical to success in incentivising abatement. Um, implementing um, an activity on farm, such as rejuvenating pastures, can be made financially possible with the, um, with the incentive offered offer by the scheme. There are essentially four steps to participating as shown in this diagram, from planning to claiming credits. Once earned, ACUs can be sold through a government contract or in a secondary market or held as an asset. Next slide, please. As mentioned, there are two soil carbon methods currently in force. The simpler method is model-based and uses default factors to estimate credits for adoption of an eligible activity in grazing lands. 
This map and table show the factors from the example activity of stubble retention. The default factors are based on reasonably extensive soil sampling and analysis. But due to the um, high variability and uncertainty um, that characterise soil carbon, the default factors are necessarily and intentionally conservative. This tends to make um, low returns relative to the cost of participation and experience shows that the method is not financially attractive. There's been more interest in the measurement method option and the experience with this method is where I'll focus for the rest of the talk. Next slide, please. Under the measurement method, credits are issued for measured increase in soil carbon above a baseline following adoption of new eligible practices in agricultural land, cropping or grazing. I've listed some of the features of the method and time doesn't allow going into much detail, but you know, just very briefly, the baseline is the 10 years prior to project registration. There are a range of um, activities that are eligible and after registering a project and implementing one or more activities, soils are resampled within five years and the project is audited. Changes in soil carbon stock is estimated using a trend line approach. Sampling protocol requirements are detailed, are very detailed actually, to minimise the risk of fires. And greenhouse gas emissions due to the project are subtracted before um, allocating credits. Sampling rounds continue at least every five years throughout the 25 year crediting period. And the project must be maintained until the end of the permanence period, which is either 25 or 100 years, de depending on selection. There is a number of discounts and requirements that help to ensure that soil carbon credited under this method is additional and genuine as required under the legislation. Next slide, please. There are around 50 uh, rep projects registered under the ERF soil carbon methods. One pasture rejuvenation project has commenced claiming credits, credits that are eligible under the Paris Agreement and sale of ACUs into the ERF uh, purchasing mechanism is now providing new income for this farmer who um, importantly has also reported improvements in farm productivity and profitability. The method includes a number of innovative features, including on the technical side, um, allowing analysis by sensor technologies as an alternative to the standard dry combustion. Um, and it, uh, there are a range of the range of discounts for managing permanence and um, uns, other um, sampling uncertainties are, are detailed in the method. And um, I won't go into any, any detail, but I'm happy to take questions on those. Um, Novel aspects of the methods also aim to ensure that a farmer considering a soil carbon project has realistic expectations for results, obligations and risks, including through a requirement for a land management strategy at the time of registration. Next slide, thanks. On a project scale, quantifying long-term sequestration when there is no high variability of soils and soil carbon stock change remains challenging. The ERF method seeks to find some balance um, between absolute accuracy, perfect accuracy, and providing a workable and cost-effective set of rules and requirements to incentivize activities that are positive for soil carbon. Ensuring confidence in the quality and integrity of credits um, is something that is critical to incentivizing market demand and hence funding is an overarching challenge. Next slide, please. A quick look at what we've learned, uh, what we're learning and possible next steps um, shows that the real experience from actually implementing the method and developing it um, has provided some insights. Uh, some of the recent responses to the identified issues include improving this baseline sampling um, to help projects, to make it more flexible, to help projects up uptake. And um, 
Also, allowing for upfront costs for baseline sampling without which the projects aren't viable. Um, there is also interest in identifying, identifying multiple benefits um, and considerable interest in the potential for premium payments for carbon credits with linked ecosystem services credits. And one such program is available uh, now in the state of Queensland through a $500 million investment in a land restoration fund. And this has got real prospects for how we manage to make, to incentivize projects going forward. Next slide, thanks. And just to finish off um, some of the summary points, um, the experience that we've had with implementing the program um, shows that it is possible to incentivize soil carbon sequestration project, projects through a carbon crediting and purchasing mechanism. But the scheme is undeniably complex uh, for a farmer to get his head around still. Implementing measurement-based carbon methods can generate income from sale of offsets and benefit farm profitability and um, is attracting interest. And there are prospects for soil carbon, making soil carbon projects more financially attractive through premium prices for linking and by linking ecosystem services co-benefits. And two, two messages that relate probably specifically to this type of, um, of project method. It's important to not lose sight of maintaining the integrity of the soil carbon credits. For without that, um, you're not going to attract a market value and that's part of the funding um, that's required to go forward. And the other point is adoption is um, supported by helping, helping land managers, helping farmers to align their soil carbon projects with the farm production objectives and making that a quite a formal part of the method. So thank you. Thank you very much, Beverly. And uh, somehow your, your video went off, uh, but thank you for joining from all across the, the, the globe here. I know it's very late in Australia, so your special thanks to you, please. Um, okay, let's, let's move on. Pamela, uh, you're up. Great, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, if we can go to the first slide. Uh, I'm Pamela Bachman from the Climate Corporation. Thank you very much for having me here and sticking with us all morning. Uh, I'm excited to bring you an overview of our digital ag platform, Climate Field View, and touch a little bit upon how we're utilizing this platform in our greenhouse gas reduction and other sustainability commitments. Uh, next slide. So this should be something we're all familiar with. We, we know that the global demand for crop production is climbing. Um, we have a growing population. Uh, more people leads to the need for more food. Uh, there's also an increase in pressure on our ecosystems and concurrent losses that we're seeing in harvest and available arable land. I think we can all agree uh, that we need to secure a sufficient supply of quality food and use our natural resources more efficiently and responsibly. Um, but how do we do that? Uh, well, one tool that I see in our toolbox for doing this is digital farming. Uh, next slide, please. So wanted to give you a little bit background on who the Climate Corporation is. Um, and well, we are a subsidiary of Bayer Crop Science, uh, and we are a diverse array of, of passionate scientists in our company, and farming is in our blood. About 30% of our employees actually grew up and around farms. I was not one of them. Uh, and 10% of them actively farm today. We take farming personally, and, and our belief is that the next generation in agriculture uh, will be through utilizing data and analytics to help optimize decision making. Um, and our mission is therefore to help the world's farmers sustainably increase productivity through the use of digital tools. Next slide, please. So as you all know, if you've ever been on a farm, every acre is unique. Um, and farmers see this variability not only across multiple fields, but also just within a single field. And so as we started developing out the digital tools uh, like Climate Field View, we really set out to solve three big challenges that we heard from our farmer customers. Um, number one is getting all your data in one place, organizing it and making it useful. Uh, as we talked with our grower customers, you know, we saw again and again that this is a major pain point for them and, and one that we could fairly easily solve. Uh, secondly is, you know, s providing simplified field insights. So we're, we're focused not just on making it easy to get all your data together, but bringing it to the farmer in a way that helps them easily translate that data into value on the farm. Uh, and thirdly is taking those, those data insights uh, and really helping to optimize farm activity and farm uh, 
inputs. And so we really wanted to look at how we could help the grower identify specific actions to help him or her, uh, you know, increase their bottom line, but also enable more sustainable farming practices. And this means optimizing decisions for every field uh, in a data-driven and science-based way. So we wanted to really have the science underpinning everything we do, uh, but also make this, you know, very easy to use and simple. Um, so, you know, <laughs> not, so, not so easy a lift when you start looking at it that way. Uh, so next slide please. Um, and so, you know, with that, uh, our, our main footprint is in the United States uh, in the corn and soy belt, but we also are in Europe, uh, South America, and we're expanding uh, in other areas across the globe. And our goal is to build a globally integrated platform. Uh, we see data as our digital currency. Uh, and so it's an iterative process with the end goals being to continuously drive our customer satisfaction uh, as our tools and our insights develop and become more robust over time. Uh, the more data we have, the better our models and insights become. So key to this is farmer adoption of these digital technologies. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a chart uh, for the number of connected hours for our field view drive, which is that hockey puck, hockey puck looking thing in the upper left hand corner. Um, and this is measured in millions of hours. So, so read the chart from right to left. You know, so our customers uh, have connected their, their drives for about 15 million hours in, from 2018 to 2019. Compare that to the 32 months it took us to get our first 10 million hours of data. So this is pretty impressive growth uh, and encouraging for us at Bayer, uh, but also for the agricultural industry, because it means farmers are interested in adopting these technologies. Um, the increase is obviously in, due to increased user base, uh, over 100 million acres uh, that we have now, and we have compatibility with industry-leading farm equipment. Um, our platform's compatible with all major brands in the U.S., and, and as we are expanding uh, globally, we're consistently working to provide new equipment compatibility. But the end result is more data. The more data available, the better our models can be. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a look at, and this has a slide build, so if you can go through it. Um, Let's take a look at how the uh, digital tools support pre-planting and, and uh, you know, harvest uh, throughout the whole crop season. And so, um, you know, before planting, uh, we have things like seed scripting, uh, which can use historical field data that we've collected through the FieldView uh, app, uh, as well as uh, field imagery and satellites to identify management zones on farm. Uh, and we can write out prescriptions for nearly any seed brand. Uh, we have a, a new project as well called Seed Advisor, which has had limited launch uh, in the US in the corn belt. And this is a predictive model that's been built through AI and machine learning. Uh, and it combines uh, Bayer's ge seed genetics library along with uh, regional seed performance data to help us predict then the best performing hybrids for each farmer's fields. Um, and so in our initial pilot rollout on 100,000 uh, US corn acres, uh, in, uh, we did see a yield advantage of about 9.1 bushels per acre versus what the farmer would have planted without the seed advisor recommendation. So we see this as a yield. And again, it's bringing a win to the farmer uh, with these insights we can derive uh, from the data we're getting off the field. During planting, uh, you know, so, so as in the slide before you saw that hockey puck looking thing, that's our hard, uh, that's our field view drive. And this actually connects into the equipment on farm. Uh, and this is where farmers can collect and store their data uh, so that we can measure the impact of their agronomic practices. So the field view drive can be used during planting to provide, uh, in essence, a digital receipt of the type of seed that was planted, when it was planted, and at what population in the field. Um, you know, it helps farmers then collect all this data without the hassle of manual data entry. Uh, combined with that FieldView drive is our software called the FieldView Cab app, and this is an iOS-based uh, platform that can be used directly in the cab uh, of the equipment to visualize every pass along the field. So you can see planting, you can see harvest, you can see spraying, uh, and application in maps that allow you to real-time monitor your progress and, and potentially spot issues. So I'm laying this all out for those of you who are familiar with you know, some of the different models that have been talked about regarding carbon and think of those data inputs. Um, we're gleaning a lot of data off the field through these automated platforms. During the season, uh, just as with planting, farmers can also record and visualize the spray applications, pesticide, fertilizer, other crop protection products. Uh, and you know, this is also helpful to measure the performance of these products after harvest. Uh, and again, providing that digital receipt for all the activity that took place on the field and digital record. Um, and finally, farmers can also visualize their imagery 
um, fields from satellites or drones uh, with our field view partners. And this can monitor crop health throughout the season and can inform decisions on whether crop protection products are needed to be applied and where they need to be applied. So farmers can act early and precisely, which has both economic benefits and environmental sustainability benefits. Uh, and then at the end of the season, farmers can take all the data they've collected through field view over the season, as well as their harvest data that they can collect, and then they can look at these things side by side uh, post harvest to see, you know, what what worked best on their operation and to inform future decisions. So a lot of data coming in through this platform. Uh, and it's really exciting to think about what we other insights we can glean from this when we look at things with a sustainability lens. So um, Next slide, uh, and actually I'm coming, sorry, I'm talking a little too much, so we're getting uh, quick on the end. Uh, but here's a digital representation of the variability in the field. Uh, and again, these are just some visuals of, of coming off. I'm not gonna say too much on that. If we jump to slide nine. Um, so what we also see is aside from being able to increase uh, the profit margin for a farmer, um, is we believe that bringing the digital expertise and sustainable practices together should be at the forefront of strategic thinking for our company. And at its core, I feel digital farming is about sustainability. Um, and so if we go to the next slide. Um, so we've, we've uh, talked a lot about carbon today and the importance of soil carbon and croplands. Um, and so we're launching a new program right now where we're taking these insights and data we can derive from FieldView and applying that towards our company's commitment to a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, from fields by 2030. Uh, we're also prototyping digital tools to enable farm calculation uh, and verification of greenhouse gas reduction. We've found that much of the data required by well-accepted greenhouse gas models uh, are things that we're already collecting in our data pipeline. Uh, so that's really exciting for us. And how do we then take all this data uh, and put it into an easy and streamlined process for growers to then calculate, you know, for lack of a better term, carbon scores? Um, so I think the, the digital tools provide a really uh, unique benefit for us and that they help farmers make decisions uh, that are both good for them and good for the environment. And as technologies advance and farmers' use of digital tools increases, um, I think we really have a, a nice platform to realize deeper insights over time and continue to identify new opportunities and new uses for this data to enhance sustainability. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you for squeezing that in there. Yeah. I, um, well done um, and very exciting, interesting. Um, Ronald, uh, over to you, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And well, I'm sure many people are already tired. I'm being the last one. I have to try to keep people at attention. So I will try my best. Next, please. Well, we have seen a lot of, uh, well, I'm really surprised about the number of initiatives and businesses about soil organic carbon sequestration. And of course, as a soil scientist, and especially as coming from an organization with is part of the UN, uh, we are very happy to see that there is a lot happening on soils because we believe that this is a very important natural resource that deserves attention but the attention that deserves is also related on its nature and the purpose that we all have for it. And one very important topic here is that soils provide multiple of ecosystem benefits. And of course, we need to try to address them all at once because this is one unique opportunity. Next, please. Indeed, for years we have been working in trying to raise awareness and advocate for sustainable soil management and we are glad that now, as I said, the world is full, full of soils and that's great. I hope this spirit will continue. But now we have a great opportunity because it is time to scale up sustainable soil management on the ground. But how can we do that in a world that of course requires investment? I will try to talk about this now. Next, please. We you know, we have to see what are the current global challenges in relation to what we are doing in terms of the conventions and our goals. I know that this is a bit strange, especially for uh, people that are not used to the UN, but you know, soils are at the core because soils can not only help us with climate change, but can help us with the issue of land degradation when trying to protect and restore biodiversity. And of course, for ensuring food security and nutrition, which are vital. So carbon, soil organic carbon, and especially healthy soils are the core of all this. And that's why we are really 
trying to work with our member countries on this. Next, please. Well, throughout the presentations, there have been some uh, clear messages about what are the problems and there were responses. I will just uh, focus on uh, two of them. When is related to, yes, we are focusing a lot on soil organic carbon because there is a market. And that is the market that is allowing us to have financial resources to invest on sustainable soil management. So that is very clear. But we need to, to have also clear that when managing soils, we cannot just focus on enhancing soil organic carbon, but we need to see the whole soil functioning because otherwise we will forget issues like uh, losing soil biodiversity, in, increasing soil pollution, etc. And that's something we should avoid. And of course, uncertainty about additionality and permanence is there, but there is a lot of scientific studies already demonstrating that we can go ahead and scale it up because otherwise, first, we will be losing the current carbon stocks of the soils and we will not be sequestering more. Next, please. So what we promote is that we need to manage soil sustainably so that we can harvest all these multiple benefits for the different stakeholders, which is, of course, very important. And the investment on soils is worth because we are not just producing carbon credits for those who want to offset their emissions, but we are going to also support those farmers because we will help them to increase their productivity, their livelihood, and at the same time, we will be able to enhance the ecosystem services that are fundamental for our lives. Now, we are focusing a lot on carbon, but we are forgetting about one very important element, okay? We are losing the carbon stocks, but we need to address that we are also not paying attention to the main gas they are emitting, which is nitrous oxide, which is 268 times more powerful than CO2. And that's why we really need to sequester carbon, but we need to try to keep nitrogen in our soils, not in high quantities, because you know we can cause many other impacts. We are working on trying to have that integrated approach so that we also take care of this nitrogen. Crops have a great undeniable potential to sequester carbon, but also they can mitigate a lot of nitrogen. And sequestering nitrogen is very difficult and that has a lot of impacts in the environment and the ozone layer, for instance. But there comes, of course, the use of legumes, which are fundamental. Next, please. Well, I want to present you REC soil recarbonization of global soils as our proposal for addressing this, trying to promote sustainable soil management, but giving a role to the most important people for us, farmers, because they are the only ones who can make a change. So I will guide you through to all this process. Next, please. The first thing we do is, of course, to know the feasibility because not all soils have the potential to sequester carbon and there are many other soils that are very rich on carbon, so the policy should be oriented differently. In those very rich organic carbon, and we have produced this uh, global soil organic map with countries because our approach is country driven. Countries should be able to produce their own data and information, so we are empowering them on that. So, all dark areas you will see are very rich in carbon. So there we need to have policies that are different. We don't want to sequester. Yes, if they have degraded, but if not, we need to really advocate for avoiding the emissions of carbon there. And on the other side, we need to understand what is the potential. So currently we are working with countries in order to develop this potential. Next, please. What we need is to reach an agreement with farmers so that we, they will have access to our Rexoil tool, toolkit that has many different components and tools. Next. Then what we ask farmers is to implement a good soil organic carbon practices. And for that, we have a manual that is collecting the good practices for carbon sequestration and provision of ecosystem service from around the world. 
and for that, of course, they will receive technical support and financial incentives in a cycle of eight years. I know that will sound strange for all of you, but we need to consider that we are talking about especially developing countries and planning 20 or more years there is rather impossible, starting from the land tenure issue. Next, please. We just recently, our member countries have endorsed this GSOC MRV protocol. So we have our protocol for carbon, but also other greenhouse gases. Now we are moving into the phase of implementation and training countries on the use of this MRV, and surely it will guide all our activities. Next, please. But not only, we also have a protocol to measure the other ecosystem services that are fundamental, one related to water, the other one to, to biodiversity, and the other one related to productivity because the farmer is interested on that. And as I said, we have the eight year cycle. We start with a baseline measurement, then after four years, a me another measurement, and then at the end, another one. But this is, the, it, it, it has a difference and I will show you how. And all this data fits a global solar organic carbon monitoring system. Next. And that's where it comes, our Rexol marketplace. So we have two paths. We have the green path and we have the carbon market path. As I said, we need to enhance the investment on sustainable soil management. Where we get these funds? Some governments are doing it, some others not. So we need to support farmers anyway. And in the green path, what we want is that those farmers who agree to put rec soil in practice will implement those good practices and then they will get a label of compliance under the voluntary guidelines for sustainable soil management that we have. So their products will have this seal. And in this one, we don't necessarily produce carbon markets that are ready for purchase. So in here, we need donors who are really committed to change our planet in terms of development and in terms of a future. So that's the first option, but there are others that can choose the carbon market path, especially the private sector. In there, of course, we need to be very, very, uh, let's say responsible for using our MRV and all the other protocols to measure, verify and report that this is happening. In our case, we don't do that because FAO cannot emit carbon credits, but that's why there are many other players who can do this. So in summary, this is how it, 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 all this works. And we have some already uh, ongoing processes in countries like Costa Rica. We are starting with Mexico, etc. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ronald, and to all of the panelists. Um, great presentations. Um, I'm sure everyone's head is spinning with all of this information. So please do submit questions. Like I said earlier, we will not be able to get to all of the questions. I think I, I saw somewhere uh, one of my things, how many questions there have been over, certainly over a hundred uh, have been posed. So we'll do our best to get back to them in, in due course. But Debbie, to you. Uh, there's an impressive array of corporate partners under the ESMC. How many of them are also engaged as Danone is in, to achieve net zero emissions by 2030? Are these companies also targeting to help promote soil health for farmers on marginal lands? Um, I would say uh, how many of them are also trying to achieve net zero? A lot of them are. So most or if not all have taken on SBTI targets, land-based target initiative, um, to help reduce their emissions along their supply chain. Um, but corporate-wide, a lot of them have also taken on additional commitments to as companies become carbon neutral. So our role in this place is to um, help them with um, increasing their ambition and helping them to understand how they do this in a way that's cost-effective and works for them, right? So we're partners in that approach. Um, Tim, I'm not sure what the second part of that was, whether I answered that. Uh, are these companies... Um also targeting, help, helping to promote soil health for farmers and on marginal lands? Yeah, that's, it's variable across the landscape. Um, marginal lands are where you actually get the most potential increased sequestration, for instance, in soil health. Um, not a lot of the focus right now is on the marginal lands. Right now, there's a real focus on just engaging farmers and ranchers in new practices. Um, as we continue to 
to scale, the impact will move more towards those marginal lands where we know we can have greater impact. Great, thank you. Um, Beverly, to you. Um, do you have any data on how current and future soil carbon sequestration through the Emissions Reduction Fund is contributing and will contribute over time to Australia's national goals under the Paris Agreement? Ah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, Australia is one of the countries that does include specifically soil carbon in its NDC, um, so it is counting it. The um, the projecting the amount that will contribute in 2030, I think, is really difficult at the moment. Under the um, ERF method, um, the project that is reporting has received about 2,000 credits over two years, and that's a 100 hectare project. But um, there's a lot of activities um, for soil carbon sequestration that of course aren't involved in ERF projects. So farmers don't, it's a voluntary scheme. Farmers can undertake good practice and achieve change, but not register for, for credit. Okay. So I can't give you a number. All righty. So, Sorry if there's any background noise. The soils here in uh, Bethesda, Maryland are getting a replenishment of water pretty significantly at the moment here. So um, it's pouring, pouring rain here. So um, let's see, Pamela, uh, do farmers have any control of the field view data you collect or will it be only for buyers' business access and decisions? Does buyer allow farmers to share this data with others or is this a closed platform? Uh, yeah, so we take data privacy very, very uh, um, seriously. Uh, so the farmer owns their data. You know, we by our agreement, we get to use that data for our for helping derive insights and and provide uh, products back to the farmer. But at the end of the day, it's their data. If they choose to share it with someone, that again is up to the farmer. We don't, we won't do any of that. Uh, you know, so so we we do have programs where farmers uh, have you know been working with other groups, and and if they're willing to share their data, that that's truly is the farmer's decision. Um, you know, it's, it, and it's also, and sorry, what was the other part of the question? Um, does Bayer allow farmers? Yeah, I think you've answered it. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's really, it's really up to the farmer. We use it for the analytics uh, and back to them, but otherwise it's, it's their choice and we don't restrict them and what they want to do with their own data, so. Okay, um, let's see. Um, so for, uh, for Ronald, I'm assuming this is about the programs, the FAO programs that you described. It says, how would MRV for avoided soil carbon loss versus building, uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, let me try to pose another one here. How have you made sure that the rec soil is accessible for, to smallholder farmers? Thank you. Well, indeed, rec soil uh, is really focused in two, as I said, the two parts. In the first one, if you see, that's really aimed to uh, small holders. And what we want to work with is with farmer associations there. While in the carbon market one is more for a medium to big farmers who are ready to enter into this negotiation. So the okay. two have options there. All right, I think I, I got uh, the other question. I'll pose it to you now. How would MRV for avoided soil carbon loss versus building up new soil carbon in the soils differ under your program? Would there be a difference in how you treated avoided soil carbon loss versus building up new carbon in the, in the soil? Well, the, uh, the MRV is really to measure change in terms of carbon stocks, right? So yeah. in any, that's really aimed to the one that we want to promote carbon sequestration. When I said avoided emissions, that's really an important aspect and that's more related to policy in order to influence those countries or those areas where there is a lot of carbon already there. So that's more related to policy and how we can advocate with those countries to avoid this. Great. Um, let's see here. Um, actually, I'm wondering if we're way ahead of time here. Um, sorry. Um, so for everybody, let, we'll do a quick round here. Um, what are some possible mistakes? What possible mistakes are we making in how we are approaching our solutions to meet the goals? Being this is now so new, it's probably the case that there are some significant ones. So, you know, we don't know what we don't know, obviously. Um, and the, uh, but what are some of your fears about something that we might be missing 
that we should be thinking about right now? Let me start with you, Debbie. Um, so I, I think the, the question of um, unintended consequences is an important one because we're dealing with biological systems. And um, if you're looking, if you're focusing exclusively on soil organic carbon, I think that is where we need to be aware of unintended consequences, right? So that is one of the reasons we look at multimedia impacts. Uh, nitrous oxide is important, not just for greenhouse gases and global warming, but also for water quality, right? And has water quality impacts. Um, beyond that, I, I don't have any significant fears per se. I do worry about time and the lack of time to invest every, in everything we all want to know collectively to really make this work and to make it scale. I think my biggest fear is, is the time element, frankly. Okay, Beverly, how about you? Ah, um, I think the unintended consequences is a good one, but um, I think one of the things we're missing is um, Having a, is improving our understanding of what the response will be over time under climate change. So it's going to be increasingly challenging, I think, to hold soil carbon once you've built it up and to maintain soil health, um, particularly when um, water access is also reduced. So I think looking at that more integrated approach so that we, we can build in management options that take account of, of change beyond the control of the farmer. Pamela, how about you? Thank you, Beverly. Um, yeah, for me, it's about the data, you know, making sure we're, we're getting the right data and that data quality coming in. Um, and, and, you know, the, what you see in an app phase is, is, you know, very simplistic compared to what's going on behind the scenes and how all that data comes in. So, you know, we're always looking for ways to improve that data pipeline, uh, improve the accuracy of it uh, and the quality of it. And I think the more we get um, be better and more data coming in, we can we can refine those models. So always looking at the, quali the quality and quantity of data we're coming in with. Okay, thank you. Ronald, how about you? What, what are some unintended consequences that keep you up at night about the work you're doing? Look, uh, in general, I agree with all colleagues that have responded already, but I, I think I will name some of them. Look, I think this is a unique opportunity, especially for the soil science community. I'm a soil scientist and we never had this opportunity that soil is giving attention. So we cannot miss it. And we cannot miss it by overselling soil organic carbon sequestration. We should be very fair enough to say what is feasible and what is not feasible and where and how. But this is not the only solution, of course. Soil organic carbon sequestration is not the solution for everything. It has limits. Then we need to keep the sustainable soil management framework so that we are addressing and avoiding soil degradation, soil pollution, and other issues, okay? So we need to do that. And we need to keep farmers on the center. They are the ones who can make the change. Otherwise, we will not really making a change because they will not be convinced. Finally, we should avoid that the market start becoming so cheap that all these credits are cheap, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper in the absence of an Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And finally, I know we need data and we are talking that data cost, etc. But if we really want to have scientific evidence, we need to invest on it. And I know we are, the, a lot of this pushed in towards remote sensing, but let's find and see what are the limitations of it. A soil cannot be seen from the space. We Great. need to touch it. Paul, I'm, I'm gonna do one more round if it's okay. Squeeze one more round of questions in. Um, uh, I'll, you have to be brief if, in answering these questions, please, panelists. So, um, Debbie, are there cheap available methods to promote soil health for farmers uh, farming on marginal land currently? Um, no, I think there are, are methodologies and handheld spectrometers, if you're asking about the measurement piece, that are in development, they're not yet um, commercially viable, but there's significant amount of ag tech focused on this. And I do think in the near future, within the next three to five years, we will have opportunities to provide farmers in marginal areas, including in developing countries, to help them assess their own soils um, and improvements in soils. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Beverly, uh, you mentioned that on-farm sensors to lead to transparent can lead to uh, transparency and accuracy. Can you re reveal a bit more um, 
information on this, the sensors implementation and how the data uh, is then arranged and verified is the way the question was framed? Okay. Yeah, so um, farm, uh, project proponents were looking for a cheaper option to dry combustion for analyzing um, soil carbon. And um, the they method does allow sensor technologies. And by that I refer to visible or infrared um, spectrometry methods. The way they're implemented is they must be cal well calibrated and there must be um, data collected for both calibration and held aside for verification. So um, while the, the method can take more, more samples, but there is a higher degree of uncertainty. So it's something that is being, I suppose, experimented with as much as anything else in terms of a real method. Great, Pamela, thank you for that, Beverly. Uh, for you, what size farm, either by revenue or acreage, can take advantage of the digital farming technologies that you were um, presenting and how can smaller farmers take advantage of the technology given their smaller revenue streams? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we have different levels of the program and so our platform is accessible and useful for, for farms of all types, uh, even down to a, a small sub acre, acre garden. Um, we have weather features and field health uh, from satellite imagery uh, can be used even without connected to all the field equipment if you don't have the, those, you know, those big combines and stuff. So um, again, we can, we can work with different scale farms. Uh, it really just depends on what your operation is uh, and different features for that. Okay, one final question before we hand it over to Paul to make some closing remarks, and that's to Ronald. Um, does the, uh, uh, this FAO initiative that you described collaborate with the India Natural Farming Program, which is focused on building soil health and already has millions of farmers involved? We are aware of, very, of that program, that the, they have the soil health cards. Definitely, uh, we are promoting soil health, so any effort is welcome. And we need to see the, of course, if the objectives are the same because overall soil health is a huge uh, definition and we need to see what are the inputs and the outputs. Great, thank you panelists, great job. Uh, and Paul, I am now gonna turn it over to you to make some closing remarks from um, the cut per mill perspective. Well, not only, thank you very much team. Uh, to give me the floor for these closing remarks and especially thanks for your brilliant animation of these no more than three hours of meetings. Well, it is now recognized that soil and their health through carbon sequestration are actively contributing to the fight against climate change and thus the special role of agriculture and forestry. In this context, it is clear that the monitoring and control of the quantity storing is vital, especially when it comes to remunerating this service to society from farmers and foresters. Different methods, project, point of view have been presented today through the eight presentation that precede each from a particular angle, enlightening the complexity of this issue and the challenges that need to be addressed. Personally, I would like to enlighten the following points. First, uh, Sinero, remember as the lead question, how can soil carbon accounting be improved to support investment-oriented action, promoting soil carbon storage. Recalling also that opportunities for action and for investors exist. While listening Debbie from TNC, several project examples show mitigation effects and co-benefits of soil carbon rebuilding, yet many challenges remain to tap the full potential of climate change mitigation through soil carbon, including awareness rising capacity development and upfront project funding. She insists on the lack of cost-effective standardized approaches and existing protocol not working with regenerative agriculture and poorly calibrated for tropical soils. We need robust MRV for all kinds of programs. Martin, say to us that for World Bank Group, soil health is a global public good, as well as private and wider societal goods. So public, and private investment are needed, as well as standardized, accurate, and low-cost approach to soil carbon accounting and MRV. Engaging farmers as central actors and key providers of both food and ecosystem services can help inform the design of attractive incentive and enhance adoption. Keith, indicate to us that direct carbon soil measurement 
is currently the most accurate MRV basis, but it is too expensive for routine use in climate change projects. An integrated measurement modeling activity data platform is needed to use high quality direct measurement to improve predictive model to achieve manageable uncertainties and user-friendly decision support tools. Concerning the tool, the soil carbon accounting frontiers, Stefan from Vera tell us that Vera catalyzed measurable, measurable climate action and sustainable development outcome, develop efforts on SOC accounting to overcome the constraints and recognize that investment are still needed. Dan from Indigo is developing an end-to-end -end carbon mechanism offering for growers to be paid for carbon sequestration through develop, deployment of the optimal sequences of practice changes at the farm level in order to minimize burden from a data collection perspective and maximize the potential outcome. Bill shows us that Dagan's mission is to build the business case for soil health by linking remote sensing, modeling, and analytics. Dagan considers that we need a third party verifying the results, but transaction and verification costs are too high. The major part of the payment needs to go to the farmers and to pilot for innovative finance product and engage with the land value perspective. Haldien for the Nori is, not, is telling us that Nori is building a dedicated retail carbon removal market with a specific carbon removal credit. She considered that we are requesting carbon warehousing service by landowner for an extended period of time and permanence is key and is linked with the land value. Nori concentrate in top 10 soil country, carbon countries, according to FAO, starting with the US. Debbie tell us that ESMC invest in research to develop several tools and the science-based standard program that quantifies, verifies, and certifies outcome, including certified soil carbon, net GHG balance, water quality, and water quantity in order to pay farmers and ranchers for the impact on the ground. Beverly, Speaking about the Australian experience, told us that with emission reduction funds, this experience show that soil carbon sequestration can be incentivized through carbon crediting and purchasing mechanism. Yet the scheme is highly complex, but interest in soil carbon project is strong and while maintaining integrity of crediting soil carbon sequestration, there is a need for land manager to understand opportunity in such a scheme. Pamela shows us that a digital tool like such as Climate Field View from Bayer can help farmers reduce their environmental, environmental impact and boost their economic and societal impact through the better understanding and visualization of field heterogeneity of environmental parameters and plant growth. Finally, Ronald from FAO told us that FAO through REC soil promotes sustainable soil management and soil sequestration but we need also to keep nitrogen in soil to avoid GHG emission, mainly N2, N2O. Rexon would like to make the link between the farmers and the carbon market. We need differentiated policy according to the current situation of soil and potential sequestration through good practices. FAO enter now in the implementation phase with the MRV protocol concerning carbon, biodiversity, productivity, etc., a level of compliance and carbon market. Well, it is clear from this attempt to summarize the presentation that there's still a great deal of work to be done in terms of synthesis and simplification so that the simplest, least costly, and most significant process can be extracted from these different methods in order to easily and cheaply monitor the evolution of quantity of carbon stored in agricultural and forest soil. There is no one method to fit all but a range of methods with specific advantage and limitation of each of them. This is the purpose of the work that will continue in the coming weeks. It is also the main challenge that we collectively face because we must succeed to ensure that the work of our farmers and foresters is recognized and fairly compensated by our society. We have a good example of what companies, initiative, projects are doing, but it seems that also that everyone is working on his own world and following his own approach. So how to help each other more and grow together? 
how can we join forces to expand faster to a large scale? This is part of the objective of the Four Per Mill Initiative and its strategic plan. Therefore, I invite all your organization, countries, associations and companies to join the initiative to actively participate in the task force set up for each of those objectives. Do not hesitate to contact us. So Tim, here we are at the end of our webinar. I would like to thank all our speakers for the exciting and rich presentations and sorry for my summary if they are not complete. And all of you behind your screen for your diligent participation and for your pertinent and thoughtful questions. You were almost 450 online during the session at the maximum, and this is simply amazing. I would also like to extend my warm thanks to our colleagues from CCAFS, the Nature Conservancy, the World Bank, and the Four Per Mill Initiative who masterfully organized this online meeting. All participants will receive a follow-up message containing a link to the resource website that will contain the video recordings of the webinar and all presentation slides. Please do not hesitate to contact us if you Thank you again to all. Be careful and stay safe in those specific contexts. Thank you, everybody. And at 1.15 here on the Eastern coast of the United States, right on time, we will adjourn. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions and for the 140 questions that were posed and the multiple participants, 450, as Paul mentioned. So thank you very much, folks, and we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.